Welcome back guys to the Bear and Scully Pug. Stop, stop. Come here, sweet ass. Welcome to Burns Gully Live. A night of entertainment. It's going to be Bingo Loco meets Art and Deck. There's going to be holiday giveaways. There's going to be good crack. There's going to be dancing. There's drinks. Get your ticket now. Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. <laughs> Welcome back guys to the Bear and Scully podcast with me Sean Scullion aka Scully, Owen Mallon aka the Bear, Aiden the Face for Radio behind the scenes and today we are joined with Mary Gold. Mary, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you very much for having me you're today. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming up Mary. I know you're a bit nervous and we, uh, as I say, look, don't be nervous of Sean, it's just the way he looks. <laughs> 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 look Mary, we're going to get up and we're going to talk mm. about Connell, but uh, okay. Before before we, we, we go into it all, I always like to hear a bit of, of the person of my where you grew up and okay. hear about Colin growing up mm. and we're gonna get into more serious issues and and, yeah. and 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 it'll get a lot deeper. But I think sometimes it's nice just to get the to get an idea of who you are and and, and, and where it all okay. started. Okay. Yeah, so I was born in Birmingham. Um my dad is from here. He left here when he was eighteen. And he went over there and met my mum, who's from Birmingham. Um, but her family are from the west of Ireland. We, When I was born, we moved back here, um, moved to Cushendall, the lovely Cushendall, and lived there for four years. My brother was born. Um, but then my mum wanted to go back to her family, to her sisters, and they headed back over to Birmingham again. And that's where I was um, for all those years. I schooled there. Um, did my nurse training there, did my midwifery training there, um, got married there and Connell was born and then the next one came along and we decided then what would we do. Um, we, we weren't sure where we wanted to go and thought we would come over here because I loved it so much. I spent all my summers here, Christmases here, Easter's here growing up. Um, my granny and granddad were here, they're from Loch Gale. Um, so I said, let's let's go and live in Northern Ireland. Let's go and bring our family up there. And that's that's what we did. So we um, travelled over. Um, there was another on the way. <laughs> so number three was on the way. And um, we set up home um, in Glenravel. Um, and it's beautiful, a beautiful place and lovely people. Uh, it's just it's so lovely. Um, and so Connell... And I'll talk about Colin now. He went to nursery school there, made friends. He was very sociable. He was always a very sociable child. Um, went to primary school. Um, what age were you when you come over? What age was Colin when you come over? Colin was just three. Okay. Um, Colin was just three years of age, and that's just a year younger. So we were three and two. Um, so um, he went to primary school. He was. He was probably a little bit active, hyperactive. Um, and when he was 10, he was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, but we were a big family by that time. There was like, there was six children um, in total. So um, Connell was into his sports. He played Gaelic football. He um, he was so integral in the community, you know, with, with his friends. He had so many friends. I mean, he was so, so sociable because he was just... A chatterbox and he was the the joker the joker in the group of friends and um so you know that's that's how he was and he was quite academically smart as well so um apart from the sporting and he was very very good at sport and i'm sure his friends will tell you that he was good he played for con mcgee's gac and um he was always playing the part of the sweeper so he could run up and down that pitch, no end, you know, um, up and down. And you could hardly keep up with him how fast he was and the speed of him. Um, and he was always aware of where the ball was. He was just, you know, just that sort of chap, that sort of guy. And he was he was fantastic. And I just the comedy in him was great. You know, we loved having him around. Um you know, we'd always be getting up to antics and you'd always be hearing stories and, you know, you'd be thinking, oh, God, come not again. <laughs> he was a bit like that, you know. Um, 
and going out and nights out and, you know, you'd be thinking, well, what time is he going to be in? And you'd maybe lock the door and the next thing you'd hear a rattle at the door. So this is, he's growing up. But he was, as I said, he was academic and he did quite well at school. Um, he went to grammar school. He went to St. Louis in Ballymena. Um, he got three A-levels and then he went off to Queen's at the age of 18 to study physics. Um, but um, that's Connell. So it, he was there for he was there for three years. Um, but then things changed when he left. And so I would need to go back to where I think that all started, um, possibly with ADHD at the age of 10. Um, he was put on treatment then. Um, he was put on Ritalin. And I won't forget after the first couple of days, the night he got up in the middle of the night and came into us, you know, our 10 year old child, his eyes were wide, the, the pupils in his eyes were completely dilated. And he was saying, mommy, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. And he was really, I thought there's, it's that medication. There was nothing else, it was a medication. And we decided there and then to stop giving him that medication, Ritalin, because we knew he had his sports. We knew he had other activities that would keep him busy, mm -hmm. you know, that would keep him entertained. Um, so we felt that medication was just not for him. So we stopped it. But he'd taken an adverse reaction to it. And, you know, the health professionals were aware of that at the time, that he had taken an adverse reaction and we had stopped it. We didn't stop it because we didn't believe in medication. We stopped it because we believed that that had a terrible effect on him. And I was reading through that, what is it called again? Um, rat Ritalin. Ritalin. Mm -hmm. And I was reading through it and like the list of stuff, the benefits that there were were very, very small, but yeah. the side effects were massive. Right. It yeah. was like you had just said there, it mm -hmm. was like blurry, blurry vision. There yeah. was um, heart racing, you know, yeah. palpitations, whatever it was. Yeah. So to be going on that medication at 10 years of age, you know, very, very young to be going on something like that. Well, he wasn't on it very long. Yeah. I can assure you. Do a you couple of days and we took him off because, uh, you know, I I didn't know. I, I mean, I was a busy mummy, so I didn't look at, um, I didn't look into the side of it. I just knew as mm -hmm. a healthcare professional, I knew that he had had a reaction to this drug and that I wasn't going to be giving it to him anymore. And that that was at the end. That was it. That was that was over. Um, can I know. ask a question, though? Um the the diagnosis how did, how did that come about did you start uh, being aware of of him struggling to keep his yeah so it would have been or? a bit uh, yeah yeah attention yeah so um so ADHD is an attention deficit um disorder um I mean is it <laughs> I don't know do you know is it just it's a particular personality um anyway it's been given a diagnosis as you know, many illnesses are given diagnoses these days. Um, mental illnesses, I mean, I don't mean a physical illness. Um, but in class, he would have been a little bit, he wouldn't have sat still. They had to put him up at the front because he wasn't listening or wasn't behaving or would have been messing about, you know. He would have been the one throwing the rubbers and that sort of thing, you know. But he was bright. I mean, that's the irony of it all, um, is that he was maybe a bit disruptive in class but he so I think it was then that's what made us decide to um go to the GP so, so I mean it's a bit of a process you have to go through go to the GP he said like he's you know he's a bit disruptive in class you know we've had calls to say he's disruptive or um well that was really it there wasn't anything more to it than that um and I went to the GP and they referred him to a pediatric psychiatrist um in the trust and he went there and had an assessment done so he was asked questions we were asked questions um i remember the description from the um the pediatric psychiatrist was he's a whirling dervish <laughs> so that's how they described him um and that's when they put him on ritalin and did you have any concerns that did you think you know he might he might have or was did <sighs> well i suppose that was a while ago. I mean, that's 2005. I don't know. I mean, I didn't worry very much about mm -hmm. it. That's the truth. I didn't worry too much about it. Uh, you know, I thought we'll manage each situation as it arises, whatever that may be. Um, but what 
so everything was fine. So he he played his sports, he played his matches, he was had his mates, they went out, you know, he had his granddad. Oh my goodness, how close he was. So my dad came back to live in Northern Ireland, back to the place in Cushendall that he'd built all those years ago when we first lived here. And he came back and he was so close to my dad. And there'd be many an evening that he would like the one thing about Colin was maybe the noise in the house might have got to him a little bit because it was so, such a busy, busy house. So he's the oldest and there's five more. Um, so the house was busy. So he'd often like stay on the bus after school and say, I'm going down to Grandas. And he'd stay down with his Grandas. And they, they were they got on so well. It was unbelievable, you know. And my dad helped him so much with homework as, as well, you know, with his maths and uh, his physics and that. He, he helped him and they had such a fantastic bond. I mean... The love between them was just, it was amazing, it really was. Um, and my dad died in 2015 and Connell was sat holding his hand. And we looked after my dad at home, he, he was terminally ill and um, Connell sat there holding his granda's hand and that was in 2015 and that must have been really hard for him. But I'm going to go back again to Connell getting through school, okay. So he got through school and he got through school fine. Um... You know, there wasn't any issues at all. When Connell, this is, this is where it all, I feel that it stemmed from. So he's, he's got to 18 now, and you know what happens at 18. Well, they can do what they want, can't they? They can do whatever they like. So at 18, I don't know what was in his head. I don't know if it was part of the ADHD. Um, I, he had a little bit of OCD as well. So he was very, he was all very much into his appearance, you know, when he was, he was a great looking lad. Um, he was into his appearance and um, he thought he was losing his hair. Um, now, Colin had a huge, massive head of hair. Um, so he went to the GP. Unbeknown to us, he's 18. So he's gone to his GP without telling us, without telling the family. Um, I think I might be losing my hair. I think I might be going bald. Um, I don't know where he got the notion from. Um, but the GP prescribed him it was a private prescription so this isn't something you can go to your GP and get it's not on their list of medications that they're allowed to prescribe you have to pay for the prescription so it's a private prescription for um, a drug called finasteride okay um, the other name for it is Propecia um, it is also used at higher dose for men who have um, prostate disease um, and they're usually older men, so they're usually men in their 60s, 70s, maybe older. I know. I think my father was on it as well because he did have prostate cancer. Um, and he was prescribed this. He had researched it, but he only looked at the good stuff. He never looked at the bad stuff. He never looked at the side effects. And if you bear in mind, he took a reaction to Ritalin at 10 years of age. So he started taking Propecia at 18. Um, it must have been about the gin. And I don't know, they were all going off on a holiday. So it's the end of school and the lads and the girls all get together and head off to Majorca, I think it was. Um, so I don't know if any of his head, he was thinking, oh, I don't want my hair to be falling out and me going away on this holiday. And, you know, I've got a bald patch somewhere. He was able to tell the GP that the, the hairs were on his pillow, because if you were somebody looking at him, you would say, wise up, you're not losing your hair. You have a big, full head of hair. Um, so you can say anything and you'll get what you want, basically, I think, you know, so he got this medication in that summer, July, August, I started to notice a, a real change in him. Um, I put it down to him being a teenager. He was a late, it's late, he's 18, you know, um, his behavior was, um, very different, very, very moody, very, very moody, um, he would be on the pitch, he'd have to come off halfway through a match, breathless, clutching his stomach, palpitations, anxiety like I've never seen. I know now it was anxiety, but then I was saying, oh, maybe you shouldn't have ate your dinner so close to playing the match. You know, you're, you're thinking these things in your head, you're not thinking anything else. That's what you're thinking, that it's, 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 he's, he's at pasta, a big bowl of pasta and he's gone out to play on the pitch and he's getting cramps in his stomach. Anyway, that's, he went off to university in September. He was so excited. Um, I remember those lads jumping into the car and the car parked up 
to the hilt. You couldn't see through the windows with all their stuff away down to Belfast, away down to the Holy Lands they went. Um, Connell was home every weekend, every weekend. Um, and it turns out that he was going back to his GP. So from that September, October time, he was going back to the GP saying he was having palpitations. He was having shortness of breath um, and really, really anxious. So they put him on propanolol, which is a medication um, for anxiety. OK, it's used in other things as well, but it was for the anxiety that he was experiencing. Um, it's a safe medication. Um, so my daughter tells me. So <laughs> it is a safe medication. Um, it's OK. But this medication didn't seem to work. So it's not until after Connell died that I found out exactly the extent of the medications that he was put on in the three years he was down at Queen's University. So he had changed his GP and he had now gone to a GP in Belfast. So no, close to the university, one that all the lads and, you know, his mates would use. Um, so he was down there. So he'd started off these couple of medications with our local GP, changed GPs. And then the next three years, then he was going back to the GP regularly, regularly with um, anxiety, depression. Um, the the symptoms were endless: brain fog, um, sexual dysfunction was a big one, and that is a a, a big issue with some of these medications. You know, uh, there's a thing called um, post serotonin sexual dysfunction (PSSD). Um, and I think he was suffering from that as well. So for a young lad, 19, 20 years of age, that was absolutely horrendous, really horrendous. He dropped out of university. So he wasn't even attending university. It turns out he wasn't even going to his lectures. I found out later that he'd only passed one of, of quite a few exams he'd taken. Um, he'd changed to maths, by the way. He'd gone back to school. Um, he'd gone back to school and he, he was loved so much by the teachers and the headmistress now. She, they, they loved him. And um, yes, come on back to school, Connell. You can repeat your maths A level if you want to go and study maths at Queen's. And he did and he got a grade A in his maths and he went back to, to Queen's to study maths because it was the, the one subject he loved most of all, all. And that's funny, that that brain, you know, the mathematical one, you know, it's always, it's always worrying, it's always going. Um, so... So he um, he dropped out. He hadn't been attending his lectures. Um, he was okay. He said he's he's going to do. He's going to help his dad. He's going to sell cars. He's going to do this and that and the other. But it was in the summer of two thousand and sixteen that I we had the treadmill in the house, like for the girls and him and keeping fit and everything, you know, with their sports. And I could hear him running on it, and I could hear him sobbing absolutely sobbing as he ran on the treadmill. I mean, you think when you do this, you you know that you're going to feel good. You know, you, we do exercise and it makes us feel good, doesn't it? But he was sobbing, sobbing his heart out. And I, I couldn't ignore it. Um, you know, I went into him and I said, Con, what is, what is wrong? Why, why are you crying? What is wrong with you? And he says, Mommy, I can't do this anymore. And he was having all these side effects. Um, he said his skin was crawling. It was horrendous. So we started, he started researching what could be wrong. I'm trying to encourage him to get out and he was out in the roads running. He was like doing 5, 8k runs around the, the country roads. Um, you know, really trying hard to make himself, how he felt, make himself better. This will help him. Um, but he started researching what could it be? What has happened to me to make me feel like this? Um, now, I'm not going to play down that when Colin was at university, he wasn't smoking cannabis because he was, um, you know, he was doing that. Him and, and I, I can only speak for my own child. I know that, but I'm sure he wasn't the only one. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of young ones would have smoked dope, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. dope, cannabis, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Back in our day. It's now, not I've, good for you, but. No, but you know. it's, it's a common enough thing. Yeah. So it is. Yeah. Um, but even on, even on all the medications that he was on. Yeah. Why, why does it feel that whenever you go to the GP and you maybe say you have anxiety or depression and the first thing they say is, here's a tablet for it? a tablet, yeah. Well, no, he was given one course of CBT. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when 
he had that and I think he just missed one of the sessions or I think there was maybe eight eight sessions um he seemed to be quite uplifted you know and um but then it all slipped back again it all sort of started to go backwards because he was on other medication then so he had been on um so it was propanol all it started with um he was put on venlafaxine mirtazapine um towards the end fluoxetine diazepam uh sertraline uh there was 11 i counted 11 in total by the time he died Ele- he was well, he was 21 when he died when you know? when you went in to him sobbing were you aware of of medication no, that he was on? I knew nothing. I yeah. knew nothing about any of it. You know? when, when did you start to see the change in in his his mental health and how he was feeling? You know, was he was this the was he masking it from you, or was this the first mm-hmm. that you had seen of this, or or had yeah, there been other things? No, there hadn't really been other things, and that's the thing about it. There hadn't really been. You know, he'd be moody. Um, is that depression? I don't know. You know. If something wasn't done right or if you're, if something, <laughs> he was always very particular about his food, you know, if something was touching something. But again, I think that was part of the ADHD. So, you know, if the spaghetti bolognese wasn't right, you might have given out about it. And I thought, hmm, listen to you. <laughs> Do you know things like that? But there was nothing you could put your finger on to say that, you know, I'll tell you what I did that did happen. And when I look back, so in hindsight, it's an amazing thing when you look back, you know, hindsight, they say hindsight is twenty twenty vision. Um, that he dropped out of his get it football. He started actually playing soccer. So he started, went into Balamine and started to play soccer. Um, he sort of broke away from some of the friends. Um, but he had other friends. So he'd gone to university and made other friends as well. But he had very, very good friends as well that he went to school with that were there all the time. There's no doubt about that. Um, so I suppose looking back now, there was that. You know, why did he drop away from a sport that he was so good at, you know? Um, why did he come away from it? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that. Was it because he felt self-conscious? You know, was he struggling? You know, had his mental health, had he, because they were all together up there, you know, had he demonstrated some sort of signs or his behaviour to his friends? Was he embarrassed by it? You know, that's what I think maybe happened. I'm probably right. In that respect, um, and so he was starting to iso- become isolated. Really, towards the end, isolation came, and that's when I knew that this is not good. He he's not well. He is not well. So he started researching what it could have been that over these years had made him. But of course, he's had all these other medications in between, so it's really hard to pinpoint it. But as a mother, if I look back to that summer of two thousand and sixteen. When he took the hair loss pill and my my noticing his change and me putting it down to him just being a teenager and he's asserting himself, he's an adult now, so he's asserting himself to me, I'm not in control of you anymore, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't get to say or make decisions for him, he makes his own decisions now, um, it probably was then. So he looked up Propecia and Finasteride and oh my goodness, the community of those that believe they were harmed from Papisha, um, the deaths, the suicides um, of people. I, I know somebody that only took one pill. I've met them. They're, they live in Northern Ireland. Um, and straight away that day, he started to feel, you know, what was happening to him. Like numbness in the genital area. I mean, straight away, within hours of taking this medication. And it is only one milligram, Papisha. And the doctors would, would try and say... Or, or the experts would try and say, but men in their 60s and 70s take five milligram, but it doesn't affect them. These are young brains. These are young men, you know, who have lots of testosterone going around. You don't know what the impact is on their body of even the smaller dose. If you tell a 78 year old man you're going to have sexual dysfunction. Really? I'm not being I'm not trying to be ageist or anything, but you understand what I'm saying. But if it's a young man that that's happening to, and even just one milligram is affecting them. So there is a really huge community. There's the PFS Foundation. Connell filled in a what you call a yellow card. Okay, It's an adverse drug reaction card that you give to your GP to say what Propecia he felt this had done to him. He felt it was that medication that had done it to him. 
And he was online and he was in groups. Oh my goodness, those groups were so much, there was so much doom and gloom, you know. So, you know, the doom and gloom on it, your life is destroyed, you'll never, you know, I'm never going to make it out of this. Um, you'll never have a relationship, you'll never have children. Um, you'll never be able to think for yourself, you'll never be able to have a proper job. This is what, they're not saying it, but they're they're talking about this is what's happening to them. You know, they're not telling Connell that, so it's going to happen to him. They're saying, this is what's happening to them. This is what's happened to me. I had to live at home with my family um, for so, so many years because I can't even think to do my job. I was a, a medical student. I can't, I had to drop out of medicine because I took this medication. So he's reading all this. This is all coming into him. So what's he thinking? My life's over. I'm 21. My life's over. And that's when it all started. When he believed he had post-finasteride syndrome, that's when everything went downhill. And that happened about October. So there's these diets and there's these regimes that these people put out to say this is going to cure you and this, that and the other. So I was like ordering stuff like ashwagandha that I'd never heard of before and something called shilajit, never heard of it before. <laughs> um, these herbal things that come from the Himalayas <laughs> to try and cure him. Because um, I'm looking into it now and I'm starting to think, you know, you're probably right. You're probably right that this has done this to you. And it's an irreverse. And so many people talking about it being an irreversible condition. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk it up like that either for anybody that might be listening to this, because it could have been one of any things that affected Connell, and I don't really know if it was. Definitely, Propecia, that the people that um, support, um, you know, um, this illness will say that that definitely would have been what caused his problems. So it's the mental illness as well that you know that it causes. Um, and this fear and this anxiety that he had around it was just escalating, escalating. So I was trying to help him. We did an organic diet. I was researching places I could get organic food um, and told him he couldn't eat this and he couldn't eat that. And we even tried things like um, removing gluten, um, you know, removing anything with milk products. We we did a trial, a trial of everything. But he was he was get, he wasn't. It was getting worse and he wanted an instant fix. He wanted this to go away straight away and it wasn't happening. Um, so that was October. On the 1st of November, I came down to go to work. And I was working in the community at that time. So it was like eight o'clock in the morning. And he was sitting at the table and he was just running his fingers through his hair, pulling at his hair. He says, Mommy, I can't do this anymore. I said, I rang up my manager. I said, I, I've got my son sitting here. He is pulling his hair out. I said, what? I, I can't leave him. I cannot leave him. You know, and I would be one of these people that think you, you need to get to work. You need to go to work. You're looking after people. It's your job. Get there. You know, you're paid for it. And she says, look, just don't come in. She says, get him. Get him to the hospital. Take him to a &E. So I took him to a &E. and the result of that was the doctor and he was a young fella and it was only after I realised he was actually a consultant. <laughs> I think they're all getting younger as I'm getting older. Um, said that a &E is not the place for this sort of thing. You know, it's not the place for this sort of thing. So I assume that means somebody in mental distress. Um, a and &E is not the place for them. So this is 2016. So we made an appointment for the GP and he went to the GP, the GP saw him, the GP was really concerned about him, you know, he did lots of tests on him, um, did blood tests because he wanted these blood tests done to show what was happening to him. He wanted a brain scan, he he wanted so much done to prove that this had harmed him and then he said, well, there's no way you're going to be able to prove it. He talked about it being a black hole, it doesn't show up in tests, it's not until I die that you'll be able to see when you take samples from the spinal column. And, um, you know, from the where the brain, you know, the brain, the effect, the impact it's had. So he was so, so distressed, so distressed. It scared me so much. And I thought, just keep him safe, keep him at home. We'll keep an eye on him. But at this time, he had isolated himself. So he wasn't in contact with his friends. He was lying in his bed all the time. 
And it was in December, 22nd of December, he made an attempt on his, on his life in the family home. Um, we were all at home. Everybody was at home. Um, we found notes. So my husband took him up to... Um, we, we rang the GP. We said, look, this has happened. Um, I'm not going to describe what happened, um, but something happened and there was evidence of it. And we took him up to the Matter Hospital up in Belfast because... The GP, remember, was Belfast, so we had to go up there. They were great. They assessed him and they admitted him. So he was admitted um, to Not Bragging Health Care Park um, all over the Christmas of 2016. Um, they put him on antipsychotics. They diagnosed him, wait to hear it, <laughs> with his belief of post finasteride syndro syndrome. His diagnosis became delusional disorder. He had delusional disorder because he believed he had post-finasteride syndrome. That was the mental health diagnosis they gave him. So they put him on antipsychotics. And in all honesty, now, when I think about it, you know, when I think of how downwards that trend was going and how he was getting and how anxious he was and his beliefs and that's going round in his head all the time, I think Colin at that point had gone into a psychosis. I actually do believe he had psychosis, you know an act of psychosis that was ongoing because you can get acute ones that happen just out of the blue but I think he had a, a psychosis and there was no sway in him there was no look you, you don't have it you know we're going to do that you couldn't you couldn't have said anything he wasn't having it he had experts online that he was watching there you know watching them on YouTube and everything that was saying that this exists and there's a big foundation in America and yeah there is there is this does exist this disease but you know if you're trying to convince somebody that they're not so why diagnose them then with delusional disorder you know something that is now proven to be existent they had admitted him at that time yeah uh, when he, he made an attempt on his life over that christmas period had he before then said that i know it said he was at his despair and he was at his end but had he expressed any uh, tendencies that he was going to take his life or he was going to harm himself? Uh, no, not at that partic particular time, but in the weeks then that followed that, so the weeks after he was discharged from um, the hospital, he told me that at one time when he was up at university, up in halls, that he had thought about it. Thought about it, but not done anything. Was he getting, was he on medication for depression at at at, at that time? Yeah, so he was on. So he he, I'd taken him up to a psychiatrist that he'd been referred to by the GP up in Belfast, and they started him on an antipsychotic. Um, it was a lansipine. Now that is a really potent drug. <laughs> was they started him on an antipsychotic before he was diagnosed with? It? Delusional disorder. Delusion. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that you you, you got antipsychotic medication before you were diagnosed with them, but I'm mm -hmm. not I'm not fully mm -hmm. versed in all the medications. But see see that post finasteride uh, syndrome is that a recognized? And I'm, I'm not a, I'm mm -hmm. asking you that because I know a lot of these uh, online forums they would mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they would create. Not create, but they would be people who come together and then they yeah. they made a label. Yeah. Was this a recognised by? Is this a recognised disease? So it it wasn't at that time recognised, um. But as the years are going on now, so it has been. Um, so Connell filled in the the yellow card, and um, obviously other people have filled in yellow cards surrounding finasteride, um. And now, so it was after Connell died, and I actually rang the MHRA. The Medicines and Health Regulatory Authority, um, healthcare products, you know, the regulators yep. of medicines. Um, and, uh, you know, I was obviously really, really distressed at that time and said that, you know, you need to take finasteride off the market for, for the use uh, for young men for hair loss. And um, but anyway, they updated their um, side effects to put in suicidal ideation in the May after Colin died. So that was changed that May. So there is a recognition that there is a side effect. These side effects do exist. 
Um, but there's also a big group of people who think it's the best thing since sliced bread. You've got to remember the drug Vioxx, made by the same company, Merck. And I will say Merck because, I don't, you know, these are... You've probably watched the um, series Painkiller, mm. you know, and, and, and the Sackler family and all the, these are multi-billion pound companies. You know, Viox killed I don't know how many people with um, an anti-cholesterol drug. In, in, I think it was in Australia um, and they were sued big time for that. So these conditions do exist. These medicines aren't all safe, even if they are passed off by the regulator has been safe. They're not safe for everybody. And my view, in my opinion, is if one person is harmed, that's one too many. Uh, absolutely, and, mm -hmm. I, and and I'm sorry if you think I'm asking because I'm I'm, I'm not questioning that, mm -hmm. and and I, I just I was trying to get the the clarity because when he came to the the mental health team and says to them that that they had this and delusion, what what where were you, what was your thoughts at this time? I know you obviously you're in absolute distress, but what what. Did you feel that he had this, did this, the, the syndrome, or were you not sure? You were just obviously it, worried yeah. about your son, and, and, and first and yeah. foremost. Sometimes I thought, yeah, he's got it, and sometimes I thought, no, he hasn't. Do you know, it was a bit like that, because I couldn't, you know, I was reading different things myself, and I thought, I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but I have to believe him, because if I don't believe him, what hope does he think he has? And that was one of the big problems. Nobody believed that he had it. And he was so distressed about that. He says, Mummy, they won't listen to me. They won't listen to what I'm telling them. And that, I think that was where it just, that's where it ended. That's where his life ended. Because nobody that had the power to help him believed him. Um, I did try, um, and I'm friends with Andrew Wren on, on Facebook, but he is a doctor down in the south of Ireland, um, down, I think it is, Kildare maybe, um, that I tried to get in contact, but he wasn't in those days, and everything started to happen really fast. So when he was discharged on the 10th of January. So I've told you that part of the story, the beginning part, but there is so much more to tell you after, you know, what happened to him. Even, even sorry, just to jump in, yeah. you know, the hair loss drug, I still can't wrap my head around why it's still available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And d it seems to me that as long as you put the side effects on a piece of paper and put it inside the box, it's fine because yeah. they're making disclaimer. money. They're mm -hmm. making money of it. Mm -hmm. So it's just so you can get sued. Exactly. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if somebody ends up going and taking their life mm -hmm. because of the drug that they're being prescribed. Not mm -hmm. sure I told you in a piece of paper, so that's it all fine. Mm -hmm. it, it, it baffles me but then again it's the pharmaceutical companies that are making mm -hmm. all this money mm -hmm. so as long as they're making the money they really don't care mm -hmm. so as far as I know the tri trials that took place and they're very shady okay I'm not going to go into detail because I could be talking for hours about that sort of thing as well um, but they've been locked away I think to be released in however many years probably when we're all gone so there is something hidden about Propecia I mean the actual drug was made from um um, some hormone or chemical from hermaphrodites in some part of South America. So a hermaphrodite is somebody that's neither male or female. So, um, and that showed that they were growing hair on their body. So this is how this drug was developed. So I'll let you use your imagination Are, of what a drug like that could do to somebody. But there is, there is a massive growing concern that there's drugs that developed side effects that became the main reason that people are using them so this drug was not developed with the mindset of of hair loss this drug was developed for prostate cancer is that correct it was yeah yeah mm -hmm. and and then people that were taking it started to notice that their the hair, hair was regrow more. so mm -hmm. so the, this is the problem um finasteride and propecia can be bought online by filling mm -hmm. out a questionnaire on any of these ones they're very readily available you don't even need to see a gp now and stuff like that there it's massively used in the hair loss industry. Yeah. I, I can attest to that mm -hmm. because while we're sitting here, I think it's only fair that open and honest that mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. take that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why you knew so much about that there now. I but would, but mm -hmm. obviously it didn't. didn't, it didn't work. I, I, not mm -hmm. that it didn't affect me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest. When I took it, I was like, this this worked. But I couldn't be bothered. I to continually go and fill these things out and go and get it. And mm -hmm. I never had any side effect from it mm -hmm. 
and and that's that and I wasn't even going to bring it up because in comparison to what we're discussing I don't want to to, to mm-hmm. take away from that because mm-hmm. the, what you're coming and telling people I was not aware of that and this is the problem with vanity this is mm-hmm. the problem mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. society now mm-hmm. that we take things yeah and even when it's on a sheet we don't read them we want the the, the quick fit we want these things right yeah and there's so many things out there other drugs being used as they're not directed any amount of of, of young ones and playing them and making it so readily available now that they're being advertised on on social medias and stuff like this here and stuff we don't know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but th- this is the issue the pharmaceutical companies get away with so much now they lobby and create laws so they, mm-hmm. they, they basically mm-hmm. make the law to suit mm-hmm. whatever they need they add that in case you come with a lawsuit mm-hmm. and then that takes it away from the next family mm-hmm. that's going through the hell yeah because oh did you not read this no one people don't read the fine print nobody does mm. they're actually now in a click agree terms situation online where you, you're clicking agree who, who, who reads yeah. the terms and conditions of, yeah. of things so the reason i'm saying that is that i, I th- that's not originally the use but when i was reading here before we come on because i was like right it's being used by more people than what the disease it was designed for is diagnosed so in our words the use of that has now changed it's not being used for people in the care of, of prostate it's being used by people that are using it as hair loss so mm-hmm. and it's actually being advertised as that mm-hmm. so there's so many drugs now it's out in the market these side effects all these things put in when when did you become aware that he had taken it and when did he had stopped when when did you be, because it feels mm-hmm. to me like you know when when he's reading up online and he's seen these people it's yeah. like that's it Mm-hmm. that's that's me that's mm-hmm. me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and with that mm-hmm. becomes the the i know you know you, yeah. you're searching for what's wrong what's going on here why why am i feeling like this why am i going this way why am i yeah so when he had and because he would have been a bit of an obsessive personality as well that i think you know that played into it as well um when it would have been about september time to and, and september. he had come to tell you that he had taken this so he said, look, mommy, I took this pill when I was 18. Um, and I said, do, do you know, I have a, a colleague, uh, a wonderful um, colleague that I used to work with, who said, never put anything into your body you do not need. You know, just don't do it. Um, and that meaning medications, just don't do it. You know, we can get all we need from our, our you know, food, foodstuffs. Um Obviously, things like heart disease and things like that. But, you know, something for, for hair loss, an 18 year old, do you know, so gullible, yeah. so gullible, you know, really, when I think about it. Um, and that's going to affect, you know, those young young men. They're, they're not even adults yet. You know, men don't really become adults till probably mid, late 20s, is it? I don't know. <laughs> no, but at 18, there's testosterone still flying. Yeah, you know. absolutely. You're taking something into your body that's going to react, probably react. And yeah, so it was September. It was September time. And I said, what on earth did you take that for? So he said he started taking it. He said then he stopped taking it and then he started taking it again. So he took it for three months, stopped it for six weeks or eight weeks and then started taking it again. And I think sometimes I've read in places that sometimes doing this can affect you as well. You know, where you, you stop it and then you start taking it again. And he talked about crashes. So there was these crashes that he had. So it was, it was horrendous. He talked about sleep paralysis, where he would be lying in his bed. He was awake, but he physically couldn't get up out of his bed. It was as if he was being held down. And the fear that that caused was unbelievable. I mean, I, I not forget what he was like, but as I, I said, that is one part of the story. That Because that, with Colonel, what happened to Colonel, there's so many angles. There's so many angles. And I liken what happened to Colin Colney's death as I call it an anatomy of modern murder. That's the way I say it. Well, then we'll, we'll, we'll go back till this. Then he's received this diagnosis of was it, what was the delusional, delusional disorder? Delusional. Because he believed he had post syndrome. 
PFS. At the time when he's telling them he has a syndrome that's not recognised by medical bodies and, and things, so he's telling them I have this syndrome mm-hmm. and it's not recognised. Mm-hmm. It's a hard scenario, and especially for you, it's not a recognised, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's something that he's researched online and mm-hmm. you've seen the group of people that are talking about it. They're not positive people. They're not, they're not, it, it, it's, it, it wouldn't have been conducive to his mental health no. at that point to be talking to these people. Mm-hmm. It may have given that instant fixes in oh I belong this is somewhere yeah. I belong that I know they they understand me where mm-hmm. other people don't which is mm-hmm. but when you were speaking to the medical professionals when you were would you deal with the local mental community health mm-hmm. at that point what were they saying to you and what were you, what was your feeling at that time did you feel like he was getting the 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 treatment that he needed or were you in agreement with him and he wasn't getting at that time, or is this in hindsight when you're looking back that you feel like he's, you know, he, he had this diagnosis? Did but you that first initial time when he was admitted after he made that attempt on his life, the care that he got was appropriate for him, um, you know, and somebody to talk to. And he, he seemed to settle and they put him on, you know, on other medications. But always in his mind was this finasteride all the time in his mind, you know. But that care that he got in that those initial few weeks and before he was discharged from there, yeah, I, I can't say that there was anything. They did say it's not a recognised disease. But, you know, doctors aren't stupid either. They, you know, they know about thalidomide and, you know, things like that. They know that these illnesses may come out in the future, that, you know, it may be the case that this is, this is the case, but we don't have a treatment for it. And I think that's a little bit that lies in the background is that they don't have treatments for things so when they don't have treatments for things it's easy to say it doesn't exist because it doesn't put any onus on them see just you said that he went and got cbt and it did Mm -hmm. help him Mm -hmm. did did he go back to see a counselor after that it was only the one he didn't get any more counseling didn't get any more counseling no no no. but remember at that time we knew nothing about what was going on Mm -hmm. so the i can't tell you how that transpired how he got that or you know what were the next steps or Nobody tells family anything, you know, because he is an adult. So we are kept in the dark. And it's something I will say to young people. And it's a message to families out there. You know, tell your mum and dad if you're being put on medication. Let them know because it's not just that particular medication. There's other medications that cause can cause side effects. And um, tell your family. You know, I know it's hard. I know it's maybe embarrassing. Um, but, you know, they'll only be looking out for you. You know, wanting to do the best for you. Well, when he came home from Matter at that time, well, it was Matter, it was Wood. Or it's not Bracken. Not so. Bracken, sorry. Mm-hmm. When he came home from Not Bracken, what was the what was the next? What 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 were you what were you what were you what what, what did they say to you? Okay, so this is probably the second part of this. So it's a a completely different story now. So you've had why he got to where he got to where he was. Um, and this is what happened after. This is where everything went downhill and we were let down. Um, he was discharged. So he was discharged on the 10th of January. I don't think they really wanted to discharge him. They wanted to keep him in a bit longer. They had increased his antipsychotic. Um, and obviously we gave it to him when he came home like clockwork because we believed that, that they knew, you know, they knew what they're doing and know what they're giving him. Um, so we'll we'll do that. We'll do whatever it takes, you know. Um, they only discharged him. I asked for his care to be transferred to our local trust. Okay, uh, we were travelling up and down there every day over the Christmas period, Christmas included, um, up and down the road to see him. You know, I brought his duvet up, I brought his pillows up, I brought things up to make him comfortable. But fifty, almost fifty miles there and back again. You know, every day for two and a half weeks of Christmas was hard going. And he was living at home. He'd moved home. When he dropped out of university, he'd moved home in the May and hadn't gone back. But he had kept his student accommodation on. He had kept like a, a house on with some of his pals. But he wasn't having any contact with them. So anyway, um, that was fine. He was discharged, but only if he was under the care of the home treatment team. So he was referred to the care of the home treatment team. This is called the Crisis Resolution Home Treatment Team in, in our local trust. And they were to come out and visit him every day. So I thought, that's great. So he has to stay where he is, stay put, you know. 
But I was working as well. So I was working basically full time um, as a midwife in that trust. Um, so it was on. So it was out on the 10th. Um, so on the 14th, the home treatment team, CPNs, community psychiatric nurses were coming out every day. On the 14th, my husband intercepted some pills that came in the post. And um, we, I, I, we flushed them down the toilet. Um, because this is what he'd done already. He'd tried to make an attempt on his life. He'd never, ever, ever done anything like that before, that time at, at Christmas. This was all new. He'd never done anything like this before. So we contacted the community mental health nurse that was coming out and we asked that she did not disclose to him that we had intercepted them and found them. So he didn't, he didn't need, as far as we were concerned, he didn't know, need to know that we had got them. Because what I know now is they came from the black market, you know. And um, what 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 were these? I have no idea. They were blue. And they, he had ordered them online. Online. And in an effort to take his own life. Well, at that time we didn't know that, but I assumed that was the case. Um, I can't say because we flushed him down the toilet. But after what had happened at Christmas, we weren't about to put him into yeah, a situation yeah. we were protecting him yeah. and that was one of the so from the care plan and the risk assessment that were done at not bragging having the family around him was a positive um you know it, it was it was positive it was a protection you know it was a protective factor that he had his family around him to look after him and to make sure he didn't come to any harm so whenever my husband asked the nurse not to tell him that we had intercepted them intercepted them do you know what she said she had to be honest and open and transparent with him. So she told him. That day, it's the 14th of January, he stormed out of the house when she had gone and walked off up over the fields. It was snowing, I'll not forget it, it was snowing. And I said to my husband, you better go and get him back. Get him back. Um, you know, when he went, he got him back. But he said, I'm not staying here. He said, you have um, invaded my pri privacy. Um, I paid blah, blah amount of money for these tablets um you know why did you do that why did you do it you know he was saying and i he said I'm, I'm going back up to belfast i'm going back up to my student accommodation up there i'm going to go up and see my friends and i said you can't go i said you're under the care of, of of the mental health team you cannot just go up to belfast and he says i can do you know basically he can do what he wants we'd already been given the license to do it hadn't i because we our trust had now been destroyed his trust in us was now gone. He couldn't trust us anymore. We could we couldn't be trusted. So my husband had to contact the community mental health team and had to bring him up. They got him into a room on his own um, and got him to sign a disclaimer to say that he would keep himself safe. He then got a train up to Belfast. Well, I was beside myself because I thought, what is he going to, what's going to happen to him up there? And I don't think I slept the whole night and I was just so relieved the next morning. Whenever he phoned to say, Mommy, can you come pick me up from the train station in Palomina? And I was so relieved. And uh, he got into the car and I was out with him. So, what do you think you were doing? You know, going up there, you know, just come home. Um, so that was the 14th of January. On the 19th of January, I came home. So he knows now that he can get something biased because he knows he needs to keep an eye on us. Um, as opposed to us keeping an eye on him. So on the 19th, more pills must have come, but we never seen them. And I came in from work that evening, must have been near enough six o'clock by the time I got home. And he was blurred. He was, speech was all slurred. He was staggering. He'd come down the stairs. So I think he'd been up the stairs a wee while because there's other people in the house and nobody noticed. And I don't know whether that's, the nurse than me or um, what it is. But I, I said, he, he, he's taken something. He has taken something. And he had. He had taken 28 Xanax. 28. We called an ambulance. They came. Um, and I have to say, the paramedics were just so nice. Oh my goodness, they were the kindest. In this whole journey with professionals, they were the kindest people, you know, and... I can only ring their praises. You know, they sat him down, they talked to him. They were really, you know, really good, you know, 
not been judgmental. There was none of that. You know what? You know what have you done? And any any of that? You know you're going to be all right. We'll get you into hospital. So I followed the um, ambulance up to hospital to the A&E department, where he, he had to be put into a wheelchair because he was in such a, a, a state at this point now. Because 28, we had we had got the blister strips and we counted 28, um, had gone. And I went in with him and I said, now, um, he, the nurse came in and the nurse went out of the room. And at, at that time, Colin turned around to me and he says, um, Mommy, he said, um, you're going to be burying me soon and I guarantee it. And I went and told the nurse he'd said it. And, and as a male nurse, and he said, not that that makes any difference. It's just that there was some other incident. But anyway. He said, um, basically, he's, he's bluffing you. He's bluffing you. That's the impression I got. He's, he's, he, he doesn't mean it. You know. I said, right, what are you going to do with him? So I, I because I'm nursing, um, because I know, obviously I've done mental health stint when I did my nurse training, I know that there's laws and there's rules and there's the Mental Health Act and there's things like that and I said what are you what are you going to do and they said well we'll probably do some tests and we'll probably send him home I thought you've got to be kidding <laughs> you're going to send him home uh, and uh, they said no can you just wait there and wheel him into such and such place and such and such I said no I said I, I'm not doing that I said he needs to be admitted he, he needs to be sectioned I walked out of any uh, and you know it's only now that I've learned about all the horror stories that happened to people even leaving A and E departments, I, I I thought he'll be he'll he's going to be safe there because he's with them. I I left him because I wanted them to see what he was like. I wanted to, them to see the state he was in. But you see, they didn't know my son. So what I see and the state he's in is not what they see because they they don't know what he's like when he's he, himself. Do you know? Yeah. And that is another big issue. Here here's a photo of my son. Here you know. They should ask you, show us what your son's normally like. But, you know, they couldn't see it. So I was naive to think that they could see how ill he was because they didn't know him. But then they weren't listening to me either. But for a medical professional to say to you that he's bluffing after he's already tried to take his own life He before, didn't say the words bluffing. Yeah. He shrugged his shoulders. Yeah. But that's what that means. Sure, everybody Ready, says that. You know, That's, Colin had already tried this before. Mm -hmm. This is the second time now. Yeah. So he's took 28 tablets. 28. And he's sitting on a bed. And yeah. it's sort of like... Yeah. It baffles me that somebody in that profession mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would react in that way. And that's why I think they had a preconceived idea of who Colin was. I think they thought that he was somebody that misused prescription drugs because this all came out after... Um, they thought that that's who he was and that's not who he was. They had to follow that line then. Um, they had to make everything they did after his death make it look like he had been a prescription drug misuser. He had never done this before. It was the first time, uh, December, this, and the interception on the 14th of January that could have ended up in a fatality at that time. And then again on the 19th of January, you know. So anyway, I, I, got, I went home. My husband said, turn off your phone. He said, make them take responsibility. And I have to say, if, if there's any people out there that turn around and say, you know, well, he shouldn't have took it. You can't expect the health profession. I would like to tell people, remember, we are paid to do our job. You know, we are paid to do our jobs in healthcare. Uh, we're not we're not doing it for charity. You know, we're not doing it out of the goodness. We, we, we are doing it out of the goodness of our heart in the sense that a lot of us go into the caring profession because we care. Um, but we get paid, you know. So I just want to remind people about that if they say things like, well, you know, he shouldn't have taken all them pills and he's put the service under any pressure or strain. You know, I don't want to hear that sort of response. Um, but anyway, I went home. And my husband said, turn your phone off, make them tick responsibility. And I said, I, I can't. I can't turn my phone off. And I think it was about one o'clock in the morning. I got a call. Come, come and get him. Come and get him. So I went and got him and he, I found him in an unlit area of the A&E department, staggering about. Now, I suppose in a sense, because we were, I had been trying so hard, I'd been doing so much with him, I'd been reading to him, 
lighting them candles, doing so much. I was a little bit annoyed that this had happened. And I suppose because I'm not a, an expert in mental health, I don't know. You know, and I was just right, come on, we'll get you home. You've got an appointment in the morning with the consultant of the home treatment team. So that was on the 20th. That was that morning. So I'm walking, going home with my son at 2 a.m. in the morning to take him to an appointment with the consultant. I thought, I'll get him to sort everything out, I thought. This consultant tomorrow, I'm going to tell him what's happening. But this stage, I'm becoming very bedraggled, and, you know, exhausted by everything, you know, because it's really hard to try and keep going and try and keep an eye and... And I'm knowing that, right, we're going to have to get up in so many hours. So as soon as we got into the house, he was not in his right mind. And this is why I think he had a psychosis. He started pulling all the kitchen cupboard, cupboards open. I said, what? we've got no medication. There wasn't even paracetamol in our house. I said, what are you looking for? Just get him into bed, get him to the consultant in the morning. I am going to get this sorted out. So got him into bed. We had to sit with him for a while and hope that he would get over and he did get over to sleep because he was really struggling with sleep and this was another big thing about what was happening with him he wasn't sleeping and in the morning I got him up really struggled to get him up I thought my god these tablets have had a really prolonged effect on him got him into the car and I was going on my own with him and I was thinking how am I going to get him out of the car to this appointment as I arrived at the appointment, my phone pinged a message from my husband in, in his bedroom. So we had gone to sleep. I mean, I was exhausted. We heard nothing. We heard nothing in the night. Um, there was a little photograph of him and his granda, you know, when he was a baby, my dad holding him. It was taken apart and lying on the bed were empty blister strips under the, under the covers, empty blister strips. He'd taken another 48 Xanax. So he had hidden them because he knew to hide them because of what we'd done and we'd been told on already. Um, he'd taken another 48. So in total he had taken 76. So he had taken them at some time at 2, 3 o'clock and 3 o'clock when I got home, we got home in the morning and I'd gone over to sleep. And I remember bringing him into that appointment and we were late and I didn't know we were late because he got the time wrong 20 minutes, half an hour late. I had to literally physically push him up the stairs and he sat in the chair and he um, he could hardly sit up. I, I thought I, I just something has to be done. You need to do something because this can't go on. He is going to kill himself. You know, if he hadn't have killed him, they asked me actually, the consultant asked me, can you bring him back to A&E? Now, after what happened the night before, would you be inclined to bring your my, I'm five foot two. My son, who is up here, staggering about the place, they want me to put him in the car and bring him back over to a &E. I said, no, I'm not doing that. You were with your son for the, the, the appointment? Appointment, yeah. So we were in at this appointment um, and, it, and I relayed the text message that I'd received, right? He's taken 76 pills and he's taken 48 of them after I got him home from a &E not five, six hours ago. Um. So I said, I want him assessed under the Mental Health Act, under the Mental Health Order. And the consultant said, well, that's not possible. And I'm a midwife. I don't know if that's possible or not possible. I have no idea about it. I have no notion of what why, it why meant. Why did he say it wasn't possible? He said it there and then. That that's not possible when I asked about him having an assessment under the Mental Health Order. Well, just to be clear, you, you have now instructed this consultant that... Your, your son's taking 76 tablets. Is, is this a, a lethal dose of, of Xana? I would say it is a lethal, lethal dose. So at, the, at this point, your your son's life's in peril. The, the, you, you've relayed this to the consultant mm -hmm. that he's now taking 76 Xanax. Mm -hmm. And he's telling you that it's not possible for mm -hmm. him to be admitted by the men. Is there an emergency? Was that because... He couldn't assess him because he, he now aware that he's taking these, or or what? What was the reason? Did he give a reason? No, there was no reason. Mm -hmm. I feel that it was just maybe knew that I didn't know what the process was. I'm so, that's I've no idea, or, or there, there was a queue. This was an appointment system. This was you know this was a like going to your GP. It was an appointment system. So what, had what was other this people consultant waiting. for? What 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 for was the home treatment team? Okay. And, and was this a, a psychologist? Was this a... Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
So you've told your psychiatrist your son has attempted to take his life two days, three days previous. Was this? Was that was that day? Same day. That was that day. This was the following. So this that is was a, the actual day. So this is in his system within twenty four hours, and you have within five or six hours of us made okay. us. Oh, you right. lifted him at two a.m. in the morning. Yeah, so um, night, he was brought to A&E on the 19th at About 9 o'clock he arrived at A&E On the 19th The appointment was on the 20th At half past 10 in the morning So I had took him home in the middle of the night On the yes. 20th No one, I, I took him home willingly Because I knew they weren't going to do anything for him Because they said they'd be sending him home Do some tests and send him home So in my mind I thought I have got a consultant appointment with him in the morning I will speak to them then of course, we didn't know what was going to transpire when we got him home and we're sleeping. You know, we didn't know that was going to happen. So anyway, I, said, I didn't think anything of that's not possible. And um, I said, well, look, I says, I am not taking him home in that condition. So we have young girls at home, you know, young children. And the youngest was nine. Um, I said, you know, when they're seeing that. Do you know, it's so scary. It was scary for everybody. Um, and scary for Connell the most because whatever was happening to him. Um, I said, I'm not taking him home. Um, he said, well, um, can, can he go to his friend's house? And I said, no, he can't go to his friend's house. Um, his friend lost his father in a similar situation, but I'm not going to talk about other people's um lives really and um i said no he's no friends he can go go and stay with not in this condition you know i'm thinking in my head are you mad <laughs> he can't even sit straight in this seat you know he was answering but barely answering you know when he was flopping around and <sighs> anyway um he says well can you go up to his student accommodation up in belfast i said no and i was starting to get angry I says no are you going to drive him because I'm not um I says but I'm not taking him home in this condition um he says well I uh, maybe have to speak to the social workers and they can um look at get, getting him some social housing I thought my son has just taken a massive overdose what what is it about that that you I mean I didn't say that but in my head I'm thinking I'm really starting to get a bit wound up I'm exhausted as well and then the final was thing that he said was that um, it can be difficult to get social housing just like that, you know, for today. Um, could he, um, he, he might have to go somewhere like the lighthouse. Now, to me, the lighthouse is somewhere where the homeless people go. I thought, this is my 21 year old son has just took a massive overdose to go into a, a place for homeless people. I actually, I actually actually couldn't believe it. And I, the words that I used, these are the exact words I used. I said, this is not care. So I wasn't for budging from the seat. And he said, right, I'll go and speak to the GP. So he went away and he spoke to the GP. He rang the GP up. Now, we had been to the GP a few times in the weeks leading up to this. Um, and they were very concerned because they are the ones that had advised that you go up to the Matter Hospital at Christmas to be assessed because we were so cur so concerned that he was making attempts on his life. And he said one of the GPs is coming up to assist with assessment under the mental health order. It's not the GP he was speaking to, he says, because he's busy in surgery. One of the other GPs from the practice are coming up. Well, the relief. I felt so relieved. Um, we, he wanted to, I, I said, I'll go and get him a sandwich. Um, he was obviously going to be hungry. Um, he had nothing to eat because everything had been so rushed getting him, getting him there. And he tried to follow me out uh, of the building, my son, Colonel did. And I said, you have to stay here. He was refusing admission, you see. This is why he needed assessment. Because I know that now, because he was refusing admission. He didn't have capacity either. So I'm going to leave you with that for the moment, those things, because I will come back to the Mental Health Order and to the Mental Capacity Act. So anyway, I went and got him a sandwich. So I drove down to the local supermarket and I was able to get him um, 
a sandwich. I got myself a, a newspaper because I thought we are going to be waiting a wee while for this doctor to come up. Anyway, when I got back in the door, one of the CPNs from the home treatment team, nurses that were coming out on a daily basis, one of the, the men who was a nice fella, it was sort of Connell got on quite well with him, and the consultant were sitting either side of him. They said he's agreed to voluntary admission. So I didn't think anything of it at the time. This is me with my, at least he's he's getting seen, at least he's going to be admitted. That's great. We'll get him in. So Colin was admitted for a week. That was a Friday. Uh, the following Friday, he was allowed to go out for the weekend, for weekend leave. <clears throat> I would say he spent most of his time in his bedroom, in bed. We gave him his medication as he needed it. He came and he got his meals, but he would always take it away. He was really quite quiet. Um, we brought him back then on the Monday, thinking that he would be going back in. This was just a, a, you know, an excursion, a little day day out, a weekend away, you know, as part of a, a treatment plan. Um, when he got back, and I wasn't there because I was at work, and my husband brought him back, there was no bed left. There was no bed for him. They said, we're going to discharge him. So my husband messaged me. He says they're discharging Colin, and I the text messages. I've ke I kept everything. I've all the text messages. The text message with the number of pills he took and when he took them, and and he said um, he's for discharge. And I was like, I can't really. That was my response. Really, he's for discharge, and he was. And um, I picked him up um, that afternoon, um, and the assumption was that the home treatment team would continue their visits. He'd gone in under their care. Um, so I never thought any more of it. There'd be no discharge now. I remember when I did my nurse training and did my and I hated my bit in psychiatry. I hated it so much. Um, was that they had things like uh, planning meetings and stuff like that with family to there'd been nothing. There'd been absolutely nothing. They increased his medication again, um, the antipsychotic and I had to wait with him. He was standing in the foyer of the, the ward, uh, wait for his tablets to come from pharmacy, and we took him home. I was working again. So that's five, six o'clock, six o'clock in the evening. I'm working again the next day. I remember coming home and said to my husband, have the home treatment team come in today? He says, no, they haven't come in. And I said, oh, well, I suppose he was only out yesterday evening. They'll probably give it a day. And I remember looking at the plan for the home treatment team. It was like... After so many, a few weeks, it would go to three times a week and so on. So I thought maybe they'll give him a day because he's only... In the meantime, <clears throat> he's on the phone to his granny, who lives in Birmingham, um, to arrange for him to get a flight to Birmingham. And so discharged on that Monday the 30th, after weekend leave, in the early hours of the 2nd of February, Connell got on a flight and flew to his granny. I told him, I do not want you to go. I says, I don't think you should go. He says, I'm going for a rest. So we got his medication, his prescription. We did had to get that ordered from the GP. The letter had gone out because it had been increased, the medication. And I said, I really don't want you to go. But in my mind, and again, I am so, so naive, um, is that my mum doesn't have internet. So I thought, well, hmm, he isn't going to be able to get on the internet when he's there because she doesn't have it. Uh and I didn't think anything of it, of course. The local McDonald's has internet, doesn't it? It was, what day was it? I was speaking to him. I had I was off, ill from work on the Friday after he was away. My, my, my brother's partner said, he's not well, is he? he, he he's talking ten to the dozen and he keeps talking about this hair loss thing. And I says, no, no, he's not well, I says. Anyway, my husband's going over to get him and I'd been speaking to him on the phone I thought he doesn't sound right he just doesn't sound well at all and again I'm starting to feel that there's a bit of slurred speech and something and he says it's the increase in, and I, I just feel maybe I think I was exhausted and I think now but of course again that's a hindsight it's my medication it's that increased medication they've put me on I said well it's too much we need to get you home we need to have a look at the medication what's happening with it there's something not right with it Foolish, so foolish. I believe, you see, because we believed that there wasn't anything wrong with him. You know, he'd been discharged, it had been played down. Whatever discussion was had was family members, you know, my husband and that, with the consultant. It was as if, 
you know, this is just a blip. There's not really anything wrong. He's okay. You know, and I was, I was, none of us were in that world and knew anything about this sort of thing. And now I've come across so many people, you know, that this happens to and, and just, are just very, very naive. My husband was getting on a flight. So this is now the third. So he's been there for 11 days. I'm, my husband gets on a flight to get him back on Monday the 13th of February. I'm on the phone to him and I can hear his speech is heard and I says to him, I said, I am, um, your daddy's coming, make sure you have your things together, your bag packed, he's coming to get you. While I was on the phone to him, I heard him saying he'd gone very, very cold and he was going to close the window. He must have reached up to close the window. I know it's behind a seat. <laughs> and I heard him fall. I heard the smash to the ground. And he must have lifted the phone again. I said, did you just fall over? And he just said, yeah. I said, can you call your granny? Because granny wasn't, didn't seem to be in the room he was in. I said, can you call your granny? I heard her come in and I heard her start screaming. Um, I heard her go and run and get a saucepan of water to throw over him. He was ricocheting, as far as I know, from one wall to the other and banged his head against the fire, um, the marble fire surround. I contacted my, my brother, tried dialing 999 from here to get an ambulance to go to a house in Birmingham. You can't do it. Um, well, not without a lot of putting you through to this one and putting you through to that one. My husband was en route, couldn't get through to him. I rang my brother, he lives in Worcester. He's a director in the Mental Health Trust at the time. He got the ambulance, the ambulance came. I got through to my husband eventually. I said, you need to get to the hospital. So the hospital, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, where Colin was born. And he went there, he got there with my brother. Um, they sent the doctor, he was on a ventilator. I thought, my God. So we've gone from him taking like these 76 pills this week to now he's on a ventilator. Um, my husband was sent away and my brother back to the house to go and gather up whatever it was that he had taken. And they came in armed with all these pills, different colours, all different pills. And as they walk through the door, after going and getting him, the doctors walked towards them and they said, he's gone. And Colin died on the 13th of February. 21. So I was on my way over and I got the call at home and I'll never forget it. I dropped to my knees, I screamed. Um, I had a flight booked for that evening and I couldn't go. Um... I contacted or somebody contacted my uncle who lives in Donegal or he's gone now. He's, my lovely uncle was on his way down because I told him I had to go. Could he come and look after the girls? I had to go. He was on his way. He came down and then they started ringing around friends and different people. And I just didn't know what we were going to do. And he was there. He was dead. You know, I had to get to him, but I couldn't go that night. I was in a terrible state. My friend Ivy came and Ivy, I said, Ivy, how are we going to get him back? How am I going to get him back from there? I mean, I don't even know if I was thinking that at the time and whether she said it. She says, I know, Kevin Bell, we'll, we'll get him back. So that's how that came about. And 13 days later, Connell was brought home. Connell, well, I think it was less than that. The coroner wanted to keep the body there to do, uh, obviously, a, a post-mortem. Um, we wanted him home as quickly as possible because uh, we're this tradition as well. And my father's family, all the tradition, you, you want a burial as soon as possible. So I'm trying to think now, was it 11 or 13 days? I just know, I think his funeral was on the Sunday. So it was probably the 26th of February, so he came home a few days before that. The house was packed, packed with his friends. Nobody could believe it. Nobody could believe it. Um, I still, to this day, cannot believe it. Um, and we had the funeral. 
and then that was the 26th. And on the Monday, the 1st of March, I got a phone call from the trust. They had referred him to addiction services. And I, in my head, I had never thought about why they had done that. And I know now why they did, because they had made an assumption that he had an addiction to prescription drugs, which he didn't. He had taken two overdoses. That was the height of it. They said he missed his appointment yesterday on the 28th of February. Would he like another appointment? I said I buried my son on Sunday. And it was on that day that a set of motions went into place and probably over that weekend as well that what had happened to Connell and what should have happened to him what should have been put in place that home treatment team never came they never came back was the cover up the cover up of the care and the failures in his care and I think for me that's going to live with me for the rest of my life so on that day obviously it started so they're doing their thing but over here there's us and we, we have an inquest so for a sudden death you have to have an inquest so I, I'm not believing this has happened I thought my son got sick at Christmas he was in hospital, he was in twice now he's dead on the 13th of February we need to I, th I think I was quite numb very numb at the time when they found out that he had died the trust they, they, had, they put into place then what's called a serious adverse incident investigation so a couple came out to our house. It was a bit later on. It was maybe May time they came. So, I mean, this is February, so we've got a few months to go, you know, to pass us by. And I think it was in a, in a daydream, really, a complete daydream. They came and they did an interview. They wanted our part and the story, what we knew and what had happened and what we knew, almost what we knew. What, did, what do you know? I'd asked for the records. So I asked for the records from the GP and I'd asked for the two trusts records. Um, and I got them, the records from the final trust he was in contact with. There was delays, big delays. So I had the Belfast Trust and then there was big delays for this other one. No, you need to fill this form in. No, you need to give us that. And then it was right up to the wire because you get 28 days. In the meantime, the inquest is supposed to be, I think it was a date in May. So I had contacted the coroner's office in Birmingham. I said, can we put this inquest off until we have the results of the serious adverse incident investigation? And <coughs> reluctantly, very reluctantly, they did postpone it to September. It was 26th or 28th of September, I can't remember. I thought it's important that we have this this so that we can have a look at it so we can see was there anything that could have been done to prevent Connell's death. So with the notes, I started to wade through them. So I already had the one set of notes and the GP notes. GP's notes came out within days of asking. And that's when I started to see the anomalies. So when I look at the phone call made by the consultant to the GP on the 20th of January, the GP was never coming. He was never coming to do an assessment under the mental health order. What the consultant had discussed with him was, yes, they did think this was what the mother said as an attempt on his life. I'll get a GP in the locality of the hospital to do the assessment. I know now that you don't even need that. You need an approved social worker to do it. And they're usually on site. So that was the first lie. And as I started to go through the records, I started to see more and then came across an appointment. So when Connor was discharged, the consultant had said, you have a seven day follow up, a seven day follow up appointment. And we knew nothing about it. So there was an appointment in the records of the GPs on the discharge letter that said the 2nd of February. This is the day Connell flew away, flew, back, flew over to England. I thought an appointment on the 2nd of February. I said, wait. So this is a, an apparent, an apparent seven-day appointment on the 2nd of February. 
That's like three days after he's discharged. This is a really squeezed service. This is a service that's got no money. It's given somebody a seven-day appointment within three days. The appointment never existed. Never existed. So then we get the records and we see it all there about this appointment. And I thought, well, why were we never told that the, this about this appointment? You know, why did we not know about it? So then within the notes, I started to see other things like he was referred to addiction services and it had been circled as routine and s circled as um, urgent. And this was after a call to my husband and the call to my husband was, can he make an appointment like in the next week or so? But this was after he'd gone to England and he says, no, he said he's, he's away at the moment. He's gone to his granny's for some rest and they made an appointment for the 28th of February for him. So that was that appointment. But this other appointment for the 2nd of February, I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile it at all. So the inquest came. Okay. I'd gone through his records. I went through the whole thing. And I was looking at um, what solutions do inquests give you? I mean, they're, they're a non-fault finding um, mechanism. They are there. They're supposed to be a fact finding mechanism. <laughs> um, and we had had many tunes and throw-ins with the coroner's officer um, and we had given her lots and lots of information I said look I said we know nothing about this appointment you know where did this come into it and I, and I gave so many many details about what had happened at the time um, there was no care plan there was no risk assessment so when Connell had taken 76 pills that had not been updated the inquest came. I never went. I didn't realise how important an inquest was. I, I feel like I've been living in some sort of bubble. <laughs> I just put it down to I was a busy mummy and I didn't realise how important an inquest was. And I had looked up at the findings there could be and I thought, well, we're not going to get um, death by negligence because the coroner has rushed this inquest through and I couldn't get anybody to represent us. So I had contacted solicitors. I'd contacted a solicitor here. I had contacted a solicitor in England. Now, the solicitor here said, we don't practice. We can't practice in England. But that was apparently wrong because the coroner said it so much in the inquest when we asked about it. But that was at the inquest itself. Um, and over there, they said, oh, it's mental health. You know, what's the point? That, that was the attitude that we got from a, a well-known um, solicitor firm in, in England very well known right across England so we had gone without any representation but the trust had flown in their solicitor and their solicitor was there now they, their witnesses were remotely so it was remote um, so I was looking at what are we going to find, will it be um, you know will there be negligence found, you know that his death was contributed to by neglect um, or was it or, or is it something else or is it not going to be anything anyway as the inquest went on um, the result and the final findings of the inquest were what they call a regulation 28 prevention of future deaths okay so the coroner so that's quite a big thing um, that she issued a notification to the trust so what was found at the inquest was that the trust didn't have a policy for sharing appointments with family members or carers. So that was the finding and that was issued. Now you have 56 days to respond to that. So the trust have to respond to it in 56 days. What are you going to do to change your practice to make sure that family members are made aware of appointments, of follow-up appointments for family, you know, for their, for their loved ones? 56 days came and went. I got the... Um, CD of the inquest and I transcribed two and a half hours that's all it was two and a half hours of an inquest for my son I transcribed it it was painful because I'm not a quick typer and, and I wrote it out first and then I typed it up I actually tried, it took me three weeks I transcribed the inquest myself um, one of the questions asked I'm still off sick from work with grief um, one of the questions asked was was do you have a policy and that's why the it came about that the Regulation 28 Prevention of Future Deaths notice was, was issued. 
Um, so I went back to work December. I had no access to my computers then, so I had to wait for my passwords to rejig and so on. And it was a, a good few weeks. It was after Christmas. It was January in 2018 when I got my passwords. So I went straight into the mental health policies. And there in front of me, dated 2016, was the policy for discharge and admission. It's a combined policy, admission, discharge, because it, it, it's so important. Those two areas are linked. You need to know what's going on with the patient. So it's a, a joint policy. Um, sharing appointment with family members and carers. So straight away, we have somebody that's lied to a coroner. They had the policy. Also amongst their policy library, and this is, remember, 2018, is a policy dated 2009. The disengagement of someone at risk of self-harm or risk to others. Okay. So when I talk about that policy, we can look at a case that happened here not long after Connell died, where two elderly people were murdered in their own homes. You know, these policies exist and they exist to be followed. So if somebody is disengaging or not engaging with services, you need to, you know, you need to follow them up. Where are they? Where where are these people? What are they doing? You know. But this was an outdated policy that shouldn't have even been in the policy library. In 2018, they're supposed to update them every three years. But that's by the by. That's irrelevant. It was there. That wasn't followed. So straight away, I knew then that I'm I'm on this road of of cover up. So I got back on to the to the coroner's office and I said, um, "Have you received this is this is March? This response from the trust should have been in November to the regulation 28." I said, have you received the response from the trust and the regulation 28? What are they going to do? So what are they going to do to make sure their policy has got a discharge, you know, that you inform family members? Me knowing that they already had the policy, you know, me knowing that. I mean, this is crazy, but this kept me busy. I mean, and this kept me so busy. Um, and it helped me with my grief because it helped me work through it. I was doing something for other people and doing something for Colin. So the coroner says, oh, we actually we don't have, we haven't had a response, but we'll chase that up. We'll chase it up urgently. So in mental health care, there's something, a, a record um, called the care pathway and it's paginated. So when I got Connell's records, I hadn't even noticed. I hadn't even noticed this page one out of 82, page two out of 82, page three out of 82. I hadn't realised that. I just looked at the, the content of them. I'd never, ever looked to see the page numbers. So when the trust responded to the Regulation 28, they sent this paginated um, pathway. It had been updated a little bit. So it came through to me. So I'm sitting with Connell's pathway and I'm going through the response to the Regulation 28 and how it's improved. And I've got page one, page two. And I get to page three. It's the index. I'm so, where's our page three? We don't have it. Page four, page five, we don't have them. On the system that's been sent to the coroner, it's the index. And I keep going through and I keep going page for page, page for page, page for page. I get up to page 78, it's missing. Page 78 is the discharge section. So the contents section from ours is missing, page three to five. And the discharge section is missing, pages 77 to 82. So I asked the coroner for the evidence that the trust gave her for the inquest. I wanted to see what she had. Did she have the same as us? Were the pages missing from hers? And they were. Pages three to five were missing and pages 77 to 82 were missing. And I knew what those pages were. But I asked the trust, I said, I sent in my you know, you, you can request your records. I said, I want pages 77, to, uh, pages three to five and pages 77 to 82. Now, this is a year and a half after my son has died. I am still scrabbling about looking for records. So not only have they told the coroner they don't have a policy that they do have, they have also withheld records from the coroner. They wrote back to me and says, actually, that's occupational um Therapy records, your son didn't see an occupational therapist. 
I said, well, actually, yes, my son did see an occupational therapist because I had the pages that the occupational therapist had written on. I said, I want pages. I want those pages. I want them. And they sent them to me. Um, they were blank. So the discharge section was blank. I mean, I don't know if there was ever anything in his original records. I don't know if it's the original one or not. But it was it was blank. So, so now I know that they have not only misled the coroner by lying, but they've also misled the coroner by withholding records. At the inquest, when the consultant was asked by the coroner, were you not concerned about risk of suicide? The consultant said, but that's not why he was admitted. So whether or not something happened between his admission and him actually you know, being discharged, that, that consultant actually didn't know his history. He said he did. He told the coroner he knew he'd been in not bragging before. But I thought you couldn't have known his history because you wouldn't have referred him to addiction services if you knew his history. And there was there is so much, there is there is so much, you know, and I have to take a minute to just actually think about it. So I had obviously got all this and then I then so you, you don't know where to go. You don't know, what am I going to do with this information or this lack of information that I have? You know, I've had his, what's happened to him covered up. You know, he, he should have been assessed under the mental health order. He never was. I've looked at the mental health order as it stands. I had a right to um, refer my son to have that assessment as a, as a parent. I had a right to do that. And it should have been done and it wasn't done. And then I start to look at things like the Mental Capacity Act. Well, my son didn't have the capacity to make the decision to be admitted voluntarily. You know, he should have at least had a capacity assessment as well. And then I asked for blood results because in, in, in his records, it said that he took the, seven, the 96 pills over a 72 hour period. And I thought, no, he didn't. He didn't take them over a 72 hour period. Where's the blood results? It says where the F2 took the bloods. And they said, no, we wouldn't have taken blood results for him overdosing on a benzodiazepine. We don't take bloods for that. I thought, well, but he's on antipsychotics. You would have to take bloods to check his liver function. And the doctor has ticked, said she's taken bloods. Where are they? And to this day, I have never received those bloods because they know the condition that Connell was in when he saw that psychiatrist that morning is damning because he had said to me, he was going to have him assessed under the mental health order and that was never happening. Why he thought he could do it and did he think he could talk Connell around? Did he think he could get me out of the way to talk Connell around? Was he naive about the whole process? Did he not understand the mental health order or the Mental Capacity Act? I don't know. You have to make your choice out of those two things. Which one was it? There's quite a few Glaren questions for me first being when Connell was when you arrived to this meeting and he had taken an overdose why there's there's obviously going to be a standard operating if, if somebody's taken an overdose the first thing is the medical attention for the first and foremost to, to the physical well-being mm. this this man's taken this amount of tablets within 24 hours I'm not sure what the toxicology or what 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 mm -hmm. way that works on your system is is that a lethal dose? Did they consider that a lethal dose? And at that time, what was the procedure? If you think somebody's taking mm -hmm. a lethal dose of medication, I would have thought it would have been straight away admission to any mm -hmm. stomach pump, bloods, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, put on IV, whatever it is. I'm not I, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but it, it just all seems weird to me that that just have a conversation and start interviewing them. now. I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have thought that a mental health team would have, would have even spoke to somebody if they're under the influence of drugs mm -hmm. or thing. Because mm -hmm. how, how could mm -hmm. how could their answers they're not coherent? Mm -hmm. How how could that be? I would have thought once they became aware that he was under the influence of he was taking tablets and he taking prescription drugs, whatever it was, that a wouldn't have been able to assess him because mm -hmm. he wasn't of sound mm -hmm. mind at that point, mm -hmm. and. If he decided that he was going voluntary, what's the difference mm -hmm. in voluntary? Does that mean he can leave when he wants? Or if he's admitted, 
there's lots there's mm. so there's so many things there that this mm. just doesn't really all weigh no, up no, to me no no it's not and, black and white and, it's definitely not and then in that situation obviously your mother and your mm. your primary care if he's an adult does that mean they don't disclose to you now mm. mm-hmm. or what is the procedure in that because mm-hmm. some some people struggling with mental health may not want their parent fully aware of, of of things and who's who's interests who do they, so the reason i'm saying this is if, if, if some people are struggling with mental health and they're seeing someone and they might not want somebody to know or, mm-hmm. or who who's expressed wishes or, or being if he's saying that he didn't want you made aware of the the follow-up or the things mm-hmm. who who does the mental health team what where's their legalities do they have to Continue confidentiality with the yeah. the patient. They have so to then maintain confidentiality. You couldn't have been told. Mm-hmm. Is that is that mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's quite a few things, and, and and it's just there's. Then was there a communication between trusts when he has moved from one trust to the other? Mm-hmm. Did you did you have they got a an internal system where they? Well, I'll tell you something about the final trust and what came out, and this is our next stage was going to the ombudsman. What happened with that, you're asking about sharing information. Can I tell you that the records from the home treatment team from the 10th to the 19th of January in the very same trust were locked away in a cupboard and were not accessed by anybody within inpatient services. So (laughs) that was in the very same trust. So this is when he was admitted for in 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 after the Christmas period where he was admitted. He tried to take his life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. His psychiatric records of 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 his, his the daily visits yes. and what's happening and what's been done. I mean, very little was done, but you know, boxes were ticked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but nothing was done. I mean, for us as a family, we weren't really given any support. I wasn't signposted to anything, you know. And as I said, his condition was downplayed. Somebody should have said to me, "This is this is serious," you know. This is really serious, and it is serious. And that and that, that is the issue. You know, it was so serious and it wasn't highlighted in such a way because I didn't know, you know, we didn't know. And it needs to be highlighted. That's not breaking somebody's confidence. If you tell somebody, well, look, this this sort of thing that's happening here, like, you know, two, two three, att- potentially three attempts is this is serious. You know, you're going to have to keep an eye. And um, that's not breaking somebody's confidence. Had... Connell, have you in with the meetings? Did he want you in with what them? What meetings? <laughs> or when when the assessment? When the in in, the, in just the that initial one? There was that's it. There was no meetings. There was nothing. He was admitted for a week, and there was there was no communication. Nobody ever spoke to me. I mean, even the whole thing about the inquest. Oh, he was and he was kept an eye on constantly, um, and, and constantly been observed. I mean, really, at the end of the day, what should have happened to Connell in the real world is he should have been assessed under the mental health order. He should have been detained under the mental health act, and he should have been observed every fifteen minutes to make sure he wasn't going to make an attempt on his life. I mean, as it was, he didn't do. He didn't at that time. But that's what should happen. But if well, you think that's not happening, that didn't happen to him. How many more is that not happening to that do? Do you know? And what what was their play on this? What did they what did they what um what did they assess that happened? You know, what did they 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 referred him to addiction? So did they had they in their notes? So that I think they, they had assumed that he was misusing prescription drugs, the di- right. the benzodiazepines. That's the way they saw it. I think that's what they, their belief was. I think it's I think it was all very rushed. I don't I don't think much thought went into chatting to us, the parents. You know, that, that was the difference between the two trusts, because we did sit down with consultants, we did sit down and talk to them in the other trust. I I never met. The um consultant, that, uh, the inpatient consultant, I never met him, um, and he discharged him. My husband maybe did when he was being discharged, and it was a quick ten minute. No, no bed. Away you go. You know, so. It 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 seems to me there's so many times that there was opportunities missed, and and like mm-hmm. you failed. The you know his his mental health was obviously failing, mm-hmm. and and he had he seek- was in crisis. He was in a mental health crisis. It was an emergency situation that he was in. Why, why, why do you think that they didn't respond to the seriousness of it? What, what did you think that they thought? Oh, 
he's, ah, he's, he's addicted blagging. to drugs yeah. and and and, yeah. and getting attention, attention seeking, mm-hmm. and that, that's the what come across to you. I don't know what they were thinking. I can't. It, in my head, I'm thinking: Is this what they do all the time in this particular place? Is this is this the norm? Because to have a policy sitting in your policy library from 2009 and it's now 2018, and to not follow it, and to be reactionary. I mean that that policy had been updated about appointments the year before Connell died because somebody else had died, and the coroner had said something about it, so they knew. This, the appointment on the 2nd of February did not exist. And I will, how many times I have to tell you anybody that, that appointment did not exist. And I'll tell you for why. So I, I, we go to the ombudsman in, in the end, the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. That appointment, my husband picked him up. Pick, no, I picked him up from the hospital that day. My husband took his bag home, everything in his bag, okay? Tipped out, put in the washing machine, searched what were we going to do? Of course, we were going to search everything. There was no appointment. There was a thing, apparently, back then, a card before you leave. There was no card. I waited while he was getting his prescription in the little green bag. When we went to the ombudsman in 2019, I said about this appointment, I said, you know, they sent their solicitor over to the inquest and all she talked about was this appointment for the second. So whenever Connell didn't turn up for his appointment on the second, they sent out another one for the sixth. I opened it, I rang and I cancelled it. I didn't. I received no appointment for the sixth. I did not do any such thing. And I, I just found it quite unbelievable that they would say that. I, I think... Did they know I wasn't going to be there? And did they think I wouldn't hear the inquest? Did they not think I would go to the lengths that I have gone to to get to, to get the CD of the inquest and transcribe it? I wouldn't hear this being said. But it was in the report as well. It was in the series adverse incident report. So that report as well, if I talk about that, my husband says they started with the conclusion and they worked their way back. So all the fault lay with Connell. He, he had braces twice. So he must have had OCD. Well, he, I, I don't deny that he probably did. Um, but this was in, in a serious adverse incident report. He had braces twice. He had a speeding ticket when he was in England, when he was doing vol- um, work experience with my brother in a mental health trust. He got a speeding ticket. I think he was doing 33 and a 30 on a road he didn't even know. And they put that in a serious adverse incident report. And then they talked about him misusing... Uh, benzodiazepines. So I, I saw it straight away. I was so angry. Let me tell you about the serious adverse incident report. We had asked the coroner, do you remember I said? We had asked the coroner to delay the inquest for the SAI report. The inquest was on the 26th of September. Two weeks before that, we had not received the report. And I rang the coroner's office again. I said, can you please delay this inquest? We have not received the serious adverse incident report. The coroner's office said, well, we have. I said, right. I said, well, why haven't we? Uh, as soon as we got it, and we did get it eventually, the trust told the um, coroner's office, she got onto them, why have you not given the family this report? Um, they said, because it hadn't been signed off. Well, the coroner's office officer and the coroner wouldn't have got it if it hadn't been signed off. So, I mean... Th- just, I've lost my child. Don't do this. Just don't do this to, to people. It's a cruelty beyond measure. It really is a cruelty beyond measure because why would you say that? I, they know, I know it's going to be signed off for the coroner to have it. And why keep it from us? But we knew why they kept it from us whenever I saw it. But I just want to be very mm. clear here. They blatantly fabricated evidence in the coroner's report about a meeting that never existed or an appointment that never existed that you phoned mm-hmm. and cancelled mm-hmm. and it mm-hmm. never existed? Never existed. That mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Never existed. What, would the, what was the benefits of them saying that they had appointment for the second okay. appointment for the sixth? Okay, so the risks that Connell clearly had demonstrated in the weeks leading up to his death 
shows you that he should have at least had probably the home treatment team put back in place, but at least a two day appointment. OK, so there is a two day appointment and then there is a seven day appointment. This is how this service op- operates or there's your home treatment team goes back in. I'll also tell you a little bit more about that evidence that went to the coroner. There was a letter from the consultant at the home, tr- the home treatment team from the 20th of January. What was written in that letter said that Connell had been discharged from the home treatment team. So now we're, we're taking the home treatment team out of it completely. He had, they have nothing to do with it. Remember that appointment I told you on the 20th was a scheduled appointment. He said he was referred back urgently because his behaviour had changed and he saw him urgently on the 20th. That's in a letter. That letter went to the coroner. That appointment was a scheduled appointment. I have all the records. It's a scheduled appointment. He was onto the home treatment team. He was onto the home treatment team when he went in. That was his appointment with the consultant. But that consultant wrote a letter. Now, that letter was dated the 7th of March. I mean, that's three weeks after Connell died. And the discharge letter, the one that was in the GP record that said about the appointment, because, you know, we have to make you believe, we're definitely going to get the coroner to believe that it really existed. So when I got all the GP's records, all the GP, all the communication between the trust and the GP was stamped with the date stamp of when it arrives. Guess which one didn't have the date stamp on it? The discharge letter didn't have a date stamp on it. And I know that they changed it. I, we went up to the GPs. I, I'm quite annoyed with them as well about all of this because really they have conspired, you know, and, and they're letting them. I'm not even, well, I'm not going to name them, but I'm just telling you, your kids are going to go, be going up to universities, you know, and they're going to be under GPs. We do not want this sort of thing to happen. You need to be truthful. You need to tell the truth. We need a duty of candour. And we need a statutory individual duty of candour so that nobody can hide behind lies. You know, it's really, really important that we get that. And I know that the family, the Roberts family, are pushing for that now. So anyway, so that was that letter. (laughs) There's so many little bits and I do struggle to remember it all. Um, But we went to the ombudsman um, and I was so desperate for them to take this on because I'd gone to the RQIA. And I had said to them about the serious adverse incident investigation, I said, this is factually inaccurate and is not acceptable. And what are you, the RQIA, going to do about it? And apparently their psychiatrist looked at it and could see nothing wrong with it at all. Um, I won't go into detail all about it, but you can imagine the flavour of what you've already got. There's a lot of things in it as well. Um, And it was in order to sway the coroner. I had written... 12 questions because my brother was a director of mental health and for him he helped me write some of the questions um and one of the questions that I asked I think it was in a three-part a b and c um what is the definition what is your definition of self-harm um so I had I think self-harm overdose and something else so this was going into the report they asked me they said would you like the questions answered in the report or would you like um, them given to you separately? And in my head, I'm thinking, no, I want them in the report because this report's going to the coroner and I'm going to ask the right questions so that the coroner can see. So I asked for self-harm, you know, the uh, self-harm overdose. And I can't remember what the third one was. Um, I have it anyway. I have it somewhere. Um, I got the first three lines. So it was put into this SAI report. I got the first three lines of the Royal College of Psychiatrists definition of self-harm. And then the next line reads, even the most experienced drug user can accidentally overdose. And I remember being in a meeting with these couple of managers and the, the author of the report and said, why did you put that there? Because... That is not in the Royal College's definition of self-harm. Oh, it's just something we... Well, it wasn't the author that wrote it. It was another person that wrote it, another manager. She put her hands up. I covertly recorded that conversation as well because I I, I knew that these people had been lying to me. So I I wasn't going away empty-handed. I covertly recorded the meeting I had with them in the December after Connell died and after the inquest. 
And I said, well, why did you put that there? I said, Connell was not an, even the most experienced drug user. I said he had taken overdoses. So nothing more was said. It's just something we say. That's what they said. I thought, no, it's something he said to sway the coroner, to make the coroner believe that he was a prescri prescription drug misuser. And I'm not being judgmental because I know that people have difficulty with that as well. And I don't want to be. But I actually, when I look at the way the report was written, I've never met such a judgmental bunch of people that are supposed to be non-judgmental. So if it, if it was somebody that was you know, had addictions or addicted to heroin or something like that. You know, un un actually quite unbelievable, but do anything, anything to save their own skin. So I, just so I can be clear, they had taken the view that Connell was taking prescription drugs and he was abusing them. Yeah. And, and the times that he was admitted was that he had misused them. He yeah. hadn't attempted to kill himself. Despite there being notes at Christmas, goodbye, mummy, daddy, and all that. Mm. But but just so I know why they were going down this line, and and so they had taken the the belief that mm -hmm. these times weren't actually, uh, they weren't attempts on his life. They didn't see them as attempts on his life. They seen them as he had taken too many at mm -hmm. this point, mm -hmm. and and it's because that's why there's an alarm bells for me. Well, why if he's been coming to this meeting or the scheduled appointment why he's came there that nobody reacted to the fact that he had taken so many the night before mm -hmm. you know that that why did yeah. why didn't that kick in a series of of events mm -hmm. that would be you know or is there a crisis team is is well, or, it was or, a crisis or, or, team that saw him in a &E on that on the 19th and did they feel did when they assessed him at that point? Did they think that this was an attempt? He, he had taken an attempt on his life. What was their? What did they say to you at that point? Did they say to they you? Were, I'm sorry. They were not serious at all. They were not serious at all. I I remember the nurse. I says to him, "We're I'm trying a diet. I'm trying to get a, do a diet with him to make him better." And I remember because I suppose as well, I wasn't so aware of the seriousness of it. But I'm not in that area, so I don't know. They sh they should know. You know. I'm relying on them. Um, and I remember him saying, the nurse saying, oh, yes, he says, um, I had back pain. I said, and the, he said the pain was about a nine out of ten, he said. And then with diet, I says, I, I got it right down to a two out of ten. So that is how seriously they were taking my son sitting on a bed after taking an overdose, telling me how he got his back pain down. I, I, I know he's describing how good diet can be for helping you. But my son was in an emergency mental health crisis. You know, no amount of diet that it's going, you can put in front of him is going to help him at this moment in time. And I was just telling him what we'd, we'd been doing, but he had taken all these pills. So I think, you know, you know, I work in a very high <laughs> octane um, risk, risky business as well. And I just, I'm astonished. I'm just, I'm, even now when I look back, I cannot believe it. You know, after at at the heart of us all is uh, well, first and foremost, I'm so sorry for your loss. Like that's your son, and it's just all these things happening. And as you said, with the inquest and and the construction, the fabrication of of evidence, it it just to me, the, the, it's first and foremost, it's so sad. It's very sad. It's angering, and a lot of people do get angry, especially to lose your son in that mm -hmm. in that way makes you angry and 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 then when you're you're looking into these things and and, and you're seeing these it, it's obviously even enrages you more because yeah. the, the, there's been misgivings there's been people writing things and, and opinions and sometimes and, and reading them things can be very very hurtful mm -hmm. and and they've been really what 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 is the finding then when you went to the ombudsman and, and submitted all this and says, look, listen, this is, I, I. Okay. So we went to the ombudsman. It took a while for that to get going. You know, many phone calls that I made to them, you know, please listen. The RQA aren't listening. Um, please listen to us and please investigate. You know, I want, I want answers. And I want the truth. Um, during the process of the investigation, we went up and had a couple of meetings up there and um, obviously they have access to records and they have access to everything. So 
this business about the appointment, okay? So um, I said, well, I said, where was the appointment written? Oh, it was written on a piece of paper. I said, what piece of paper? There was no piece of paper. Um, so this was turning and throwing and coming back via the investigating officer with the ombudsman. So they must have interviewed some of the staff. And one of the responses was, well, maybe I put it into the green. So this, you're talking two years now after Connell died. We think we might have put it into the medicine bag on the triplicate copy. So there's like a triplicate copy. So when medicine then, when medicines used to order prescriptions in a hospital, they come in a triplicate copy and one copy goes into the notes and one copy goes to the pharmacy. And then you have the bottom yellow copy that sits in the bag as the patient's thought they'd written the appointment on the patients. Well, um, so this was going to solve all these problems about this appointment. It was definitely going to be written on this triplicate copy. So this was the ombudsman coming back to me that that's where they think they've written, they, they wrote the appointment. And I'm starting to get a little bit suspicious now as the ombudsman. So I've already, I've, or, I've already had the issue with the falsified records. And I mean, there is more to that with the falsified records as well, which I haven't told you. We'd be here all day if I went through it. I'd have to sit and put them out in front of you to show you. Um, and I'm starting to get a little bit suspicious now. But anyway, sitting on top of our fridge for two years is the green medicine bag. And I reach into it and I take out the triplicate copy. And nowhere on the triplicate copy is an appointment written. And then they wanted, the ombudsman wanted a photocopy of that. So I gave him a photocopy of that. In the meantime, I'm going to the, all the regulators. So I've gone to the NMC, Nursing and Midwifery Council, about the falsification of the appointment because not it's not just this this um, actual card and appointment, it's in the records. So there's staff have falsified the notes to say there was this appointment. Um, I've gone to the GMC because a consultant has lied to me about him being assessed under the mental health order and it not happening. I've gone to the HCPC, which is the Healthcare Professionals um, Regulator. So that'd be like your your um, OTs and that sort of thing. Not, yeah, yeah. Um, and through it all, the hoops that you have to jump through, the information that you have to give them. And, you know, I, I spoke to everybody, the Professional Standards Agency. I even complained to them about the regulators. You know, this is how bad it was getting. I'm going to everybody. And when I gathered all my responses up from the regulators and looked at them and read them, I thought, these have been written by the same people. So you've got the GMC in Manchester. You've got the NMC in London. I don't know where the HCPC is. I think it could be Manchester. I'm not sure. And I'm looking at it. I'm thinking that's exactly the same style. So if you're a reader like I would be, you know people's style of writing and how, how they write. And I actually contacted a medical director that I was friendly with. And I said, when you send a complaint to one of the regulators, like the NMC or the GMC, I said, do they then send that complaint to the people you're complaining about and get them to respond uh, on their headed paper? He says, yeah, that's exactly what they do. So basically, I've already complained to the trust. <laughs> so now I'm going to the regulators, but the regulators are sending my complaints to the trust. So what happens is they're basically saying, look, this is your problem, the regulators, because they're only, really it's just window dressing. So your regulators are just they're just window dressing. They're sending every complaint from because you could you imagine now the way the health service is, how many complaints they get? You'd need a heck of a lot of staff to deal with all of that. So they send everything back to the trust. But the ombudsman's an individual body. That's different. What, so, what was their okay. response? So uh, that's why I'm telling you about the regulators, because I had, so in Connell, in Con Connell's records, now this is the occupational, I always get mixed up between occupational health, occupational therapist, the occupational therapist. So they had written that Connell had said, so this is his own words, that the worst times of his life were caused by a prescription drug. Now that was Propecia. That's what he was talking about. But in between, a little arrow was drawn up and above that was written misuse, the word misuse. Now, I know that was written after. That arrow has been drawn up. And Connell was talking about a hair loss drug. That's all he talked about. That was in his head constantly. But they had written the word misuse. So there you have a record straight away that's letting the coroner know that this person 
is prescription drug misuser. They've put an arrow in and put prescription drug misuse. I know this is a technicality, <laughs> but if he's using a prostate drug for hair loss, it's misused. It's not misuse if you're taking it as prescribed. If you take pres- was that prescribed as- by a doctor? Yeah. Right, okay. Mm-hmm. And that was prescribed for the use of hair loss? Yes. Okay. So it's not misuse? Uh, no, no. But, uh, but what I mean is they would have technically been and the way they be and how they write these things. But if he's prescribed by those a records. doctor. So he's sertraline, he's venlafaxine, he's um, metazapine. Uh, every single medication that he had, he never, ever misused them and took them as prescribed. He was never a prescription drug misuser of any kind. You know, he smoked cannabis. I know that. And I, I, I have a letter that was written to his GP by him. Um, he never sent it, but it was him being frank, desperate. Look, this is what I've taken. I took cocaine twice since I've been at uni. Could you know, look at trying to look to see what have I done that's made me like this? And then what was what was the findings then? <laughs> so I had asked the ombudsman about a consultant being dishonest. I said, you know, you really need to support me with the GMC um, and this complaint that has gone in because we cannot have consultants lying to family members and patients. Um, And he said, well, we don't have any. We have no influence whatsoever over regulators. We, We have nothing. We're separate from them. We have nothing to do with it. So then when I went to the HCPC about um, this record that had been written, where it had been an arrow drawn up and misuse written in, separate from all the other writing, I um, I said, you know, are you, are you even going to look at it? Are you even going to investigate? Are you even going to look at the writing to see that it's a different, you know, pen, a different thickness? Are you even going to look at it? And... The response was, well, the ombudsman has no concerns about this practitioner. So straight away, I know he cannot, they cannot be trusted. He, he has lied, that this investigator has lied to me. They've said they have no influence over, and yet here they are, influencing a regulator. So I was starting to get a little bit annoyed. So that was, <laughs> again, um, 2019. The report, no, so we went to the match in 2018. So 2019, the report was due to be published in April. The investigating officer said there's no evidence that this appointment exists. And I sort of breathed a sigh of relief and I think tears came to my eyes because I thought in my in my mind, I've always known that appointment never existed. Um, that means that the trust solicitor also lied when they went to the inquest as well. So this is a, it's quite awful really when you think about it. Um, he said there's no exist- there's no proof there's no definitive proof of its existence um, and I waited for this report the report's due in April so it's supposed to be about 50 weeks that you get a report from the ombudsman and April came and April went and there was no report so I think it was May time maybe, maybe later, maybe June I contacted them, I said you know where is the report, the report is due Um, oh, we're finalising some reports and we're moving office. Now, I don't think they actually did move office, but I do know that the ombudsman herself did move office. I think she became the um, police ombudsman. So they weren't lying. When you say about you're not lying, these little white lies that are told, that isn't a lie in effect. So to me, it was that they were moving office, so their papers were everywhere. But it was, in fact, the ombudsman herself was moving office. But it wasn't a lie they were telling me. They didn't say it was she that was moving. They said, we're moving office. So I waited and nothing happened. So I was getting a little bit annoyed and I thought, they're not going to tell, I'm not going to get the truth out of them. I'm not going to get the full extent of what happened with Connell out of them. So I started to think, what will I do? So I'm always trying to think outside the box and I thought, I'm going to get an independent expert myself. So I gathered Connell's notes up, warts and all. Everything, all the bad bits and all the bits in between, everything. I thought they're going to know everything. 
um, and I'm going to send that to them and I'm going to ask them what I want them to look, what I want you to look for. I want you to tell me, was the care that my son received under these people negligent? I think it took him about, so I'm with an ombudsman for about, what we were talking a year now and the report came back within three, four weeks from a consultant psychiatrist expert witness. Unequivocal negligence. So there I had it. I didn't really need the ombudsman's report, but I wanted it. I wanted it because it would be put into the public domain and it would make sure that it doesn't happen to somebody else, um, you know, because they are this public body. Um, October, no report. Um, I got a solicitor engaged now um, and said, kept going back to him. I said, where is the report? I said, are you deliberately... Tr-? So this is... Tr- 2019 so we're approaching 2020 and I want the truth I don't want it brushed under the carpet because I from what I've seen so far that's exactly what you want done you want it all brushed under the carpet so the report never came I asked them were they trying to take us past the three-year statute of limitation which is how long you have to take somebody to court for and the reason I want to take them take them to court I don't want to take them to court for money I don't want money I want them to tell the truth I want them to explain to me why they lied to me I want them to explain to me why they treated my son the way they did and why he's dead and I want them to explain to me why did they cover up after he died and cause us more grief cause me so much pain over the years so I got a letter back from the ombudsman saying, what do you mean by the three-year statute of limitation? Literally, that's what the letter said. So they were already asking, are you planning on taking legal action? Because we don't do investigations. But this investigation is supposed to be completed. This report is supposed to be tied together and put out. Um, But we were taking on a a, a merry-go-round, really, when I think about it. So I, I said... I got my solicitor to write to them to say, well, now that the investigation is complete, really, would it not be in the best interest to release this report? So should the ombudsman not release the report for the greater good of everybody? You know, for all of us people? They didn't. They said they weren't releasing it. So on the Saturday before Christmas, they, we received a letter to say that they were dropping well, you couldn't say that it did say they were dropping the investigation, but the investigation was concluded, but they were dropping it and they wouldn't be they wouldn't be releasing the report. The investigation had been finished. People had been interviewed. Records had been looked at. So what did the they say? The report was being compiled. <laughs> what did they say in the letter? Because you're seeking legal yeah. action, we won't be releasing. The- yeah. I don't understand that. If this is an independent body and what they find is independently factual... What matter? Because a lot of people wouldn't be aware that something untoward happened, and when they approached them, well, they would have a notion. But they would once they find out. A lot of people have in the past taken legal action on on the findings of what the ombudsman mm-hmm. come back with. Yeah, but it has to be within the three years, and if you don't do it within three years, you've got to remember we're approaching. This what, is December. What, what? Connell will be dead three years in the February. Now, when you're now. When this is all playing out like this, and everywhere you're turning, the people are all closing down. They're saying the same thing. What What do you think behind it all is the motivating factor of what? Why? What? Why would the ombuds? Why would so many of these different regulators and bodies? What do you think was the reasoning for them closing down and withdrawing that from you? I think because of the dishonesty that went on. I think because of lying in uh, at an inquest because they the. This would actually be done. This is this is the NHS. We are supposed to be. I mean, I am part of that. I am part of the NHS. We are there to help people, to look after them, to be kind and caring. If they do, if they did what they did to me, an employee working in that area, well, I'm sorry, I'm none of you are immune. Then, you know. That they will cover up. This is perjury. This is, you know, we 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 weren't treated particularly nice either by the coroner. So, you know, we had to fight to get even that regulation twenty eight. And and I'm going to have to try and now and go back and get a new inquest for Connell, because of 
of the lies that were told at the first one. And I, I need the truth to be out there. I mean, that's so important for me. Um, why? Why did they do it? Because there could be lots of reasons. Northern Ireland, um, it's a new dawn. It's a new era. Um, you know, we came here the year of the Good Friday Agreement. It was, it was good times. Great. It's going to be fantastic. Our children are going to love it here. Um, you know, are you... Uh, to me, a lot, there's a lot of incompetence up in these senior levels. They all know each other. You have to understand they all know each other. They're all from the same circles. They all look after each other. They all look out for each other. Um, you know, the ombudsman herself had worked with the mental health director and the housing executive. So that's the sort of that's the sort of thing you have going on here. Um, and they're looking after their own interests. It's a, it's a self-preservation, self-serving thing. And they do not want stories of cover-ups or preventable deaths. Because I need to go on to the next bit then about what happened then in the years that, that followed. So you have your RQIA. But, but it seems <coughs> it seems like such a complicated situation to be in. Mm -hmm. But all you're trying to figure out is, did the mental health order have procedures in place mm -hmm. that weren't followed up? Mm -hmm. Is that right in saying, though? Is that but what you're trying to get down it's to? It's now turned to a I more just, sinister. Yeah, yeah. That but there has been cover up. There, there's oh, been yes, cover up. There's been a cover up. What what I'm saying is that we, you know, speak out, reach out. There's help out there. I, I went with my son to get help, and instead of receiving that help, we were lied to, and then he died, and then they covered up. That is the crux of it. And, and I'm not accepting it. You know, my son had a right to his life on this earth. You know, we have um, Human Rights Act. You know, even even the Human Rights Commission says it's nothing to do with them. I don't know who it's to do with if it's nothing to do with them. You know, we've been to every organisation. I have been to every organisation. Um, but I was going to go on to why do I believe it was like this? Um, it was a journalist had come to me who told me about um, something that was on the RQI website. And it was the trust had had a little away day with the RQI and made a presentation. And it was quite clear who the presentation was about. It said a Mr. C. McSee and who had travelled to Birmingham. And they had done this presentation based on the Regulation 28. I was never so angry when I seen it because for a start, we hadn't been asked if it was OK for the RQIA, who I remember done nothing for us when I had gone to them, um, that they had actually put this out on their website for everybody to see about the Regulation 28 that was based on, remember, a lie about not having a policy um, for sharing appointments that didn't exist. Um, and so I, I contacted them. I was really, really very angry. And I and they said, oh, he's, um, his identity has been compromised. We will take it down. And I remember writing back to them. I said, it's not about his identity being compromised. I said, it's about the lie that that presentation is based on, the Regulation 28, which is, is a lie. Um, anyway, but the, the bluff, you get bluff all the time. You know, they come out with so much bluff, it's quite unbelievable. But I, I'm quite thick skinned so I, I just take it all now so um, so anyway what happened then was I got involved with a group called Participation and Practice of Rights um, down in Belfast Sarah Boyce um, heads that up with a few others Lisa Morrison lovely lovely group of people um, looking at looking at human rights the human rights of people in Northern Ireland um, and got involved with them. So um, one of those had taken a judicial review last year against the RQIA. Apparently, for 14 years, the RQIA has failed to regulate, and it's their duty to, community mental health services. What is the RQIA abbreviation? What is that? So it's the Regional Quality Improvement Authority. So they're, they are like the CQC in England, right, okay. Care Quality Commission. 
Um, so they are there. So there's that's basically like, so, you know, you take your car for an MOT or you take your car for MOT and it gets checked over to see if it's safe for the road. And if it's not, you have to do repairs and away you go. You need we need to know that you are safe on the road. Basically, what this is, is like is it, it's MOT, you're going out and checking services are safe. So is this a governing body for mental health, physical health or all, in, all health? All health. And all trusts or? In all. Okay. Mm -hmm. They had been regulating private, they do private as well because they do nursing homes as well. Okay. But they hadn't been doing it in the statutory services. So for 14 years, they had failed to regulate. So they had failed to safety check. The services that were out there, and I, I'm not just talking about the crisis team. We're talking about eating disorders. We are talking about elderly mentally ill. Um, we're talking about dementia. Um, we're talking about everything, literally everything. They have failed for 14 years to regulate it. This is huge. This is huge. This is a big failure. And all the politicians know about it. And it seems... and. So far, they have done nothing to remedy it. So they're not changing what they were doing. Um, they're, because if they do change, people will start saying, well, how come you didn't do that whenever our loved ones were being looked after? So they're not checking the quality and standards of the care that's been provided. So you do not know what you are getting. You would not go anywhere. You wouldn't buy a, a, a toy for your child knowing that it hadn't been quality standard checked and was age appropriate or whatever. You know, but this service is out there and is allowed to do whatever it wants because nobody is watching them. But you have, if you have a regulation body there and they haven't been doing their job for 14 years, what have they been doing? Well, they've been regulating other things, but they haven't been regulating that area that they are supposed to regulate. And mental health. And community mental health services. Yeah. yeah. And where is this? Where where did this come from? That that, that was a judicial review. Judicial review. A, 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 Gentleman that took it um, here in Belfast last year. Um, yeah, because there, there, normally in in such a there's been a lot of different agencies and a lot of different things that that you have went to and mm -hmm, turned to mm -hmm. and all they've been saying the same thing. Normally, what we find in situations like that, there's a cover up of so many organisations, bodies. There's a mass motivating factor, whether it be money, whether it be personal opinion public opinion, PR, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. What do you, and I know I've asked you that in a way, but do you think it's it's the PR of that? Do you think they, when they've, they've, they've made a mistake, they, they haven't given the quality of care? Do you think this is a, do you think this is a one-off situation or do you think that this is a standard and because people aren't, do you think that this is a, is a becoming like a, a behavior or or what what is your thoughts on that since since mm -hmm. you've spent so long now being involved in that there what was your feeling because you obviously got a feeling that that it was taking so long for the 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 initial report to come through that there might be something not right in this because you you started mm -hmm. looking into it in depth mm -hmm. so you you would have had your suspicions of mm -hmm. this there's something not there's something not right here was this did you feel that this was becoming a more a norm when when mm -hmm. if 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 not and i and, and no way and i ever say it but in in like you colin passed away mm -hmm. they have now went in and had a crisis meeting mm -hmm. and and said right we need to tick the boxes and mm -hmm. and make sure that when the paperwork weighs up it, it's all right do you think this is becoming a, a common practice Right, yes, yes, right across the UK. You mean about when they're feeling being well, dishonest, covering it up? Yeah, that's what you mean. Is that common? It's common. It's so common. I mean, it's uh, this last weekend. It's all it's all over the papers in England. You don't hear it here, though. You don't hear about it. Um, I don't know what it is about this place. Um, I do know that you've got the highest statistics here than the rest of the UK. So why isn't it not talked about? Do you know what? There's no statistics. How many people died within a mental health service setting last year? Do you know? No. But How that, many that has to be public information. It's not. So if somebody's engaged collated. with a mental health team and, mm -hmm. and the they've died. statistics aren't there. That there's no. That, that to me mm -hmm. sounds weird. But mm -hmm. so what? It is weird. And last year, regarding those 
services, those community services, there was 50,000 50, accesses per, per for one smaller trust here to those services. Now, it could be the same person accessing maybe three or four different services. Not likely to be, but could be. But 50,000 is a lot of something that's not regulated, of something that's not safety checked. So something we don't know, know that they're following the guidelines, they're following NICE guidelines, they're following the care pathway. You know, they're not following it. And now they're going to have a new, uh, um, they've got the new uh, Protect Life 2 that's going to be extended when nobody's nobody's monitoring it, nobody's regulating it. What 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 is, obviously the truth is the ultimate thing. You want the truth. Yeah. But what... Do because they vilified see, him. What do you want to see happen? Because there's one thing, and and we do talk, and we've had people on here that they they've they've dealt with the the community mental health team, the Christ team, and it was their lifesaver that they've said to us yeah. that that was theirs. So sometimes when things are wrong, I want everyone to shout it loud and let people know. That's how we learn. That's how we improve. That's how yeah. services grow. All services. If it's massively overstretched and underfunded, well then let's shine the light on. This happened because there wasn't enough people. We, there's not paid enough. Uh, there's not enough investment in mental yeah. health. We know which is a massive, massive problem in Northern Ireland. But the, the one thing I always worry about is when when we say this and 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 it is it's it's such it's it's a tragedy, mm -hmm. but I worry that we dissuade some people from from accessing them services when we know that they've saved previous guests' life. And what is it? Do, do you want to see it a more regulated, being held to a higher standard? Oh, more, I would expect it to have a standard, <laughs> because I have to say. That there was no, you've got to remember that he had nothing. He came away with no, no care plan, nothing, no signposting, nothing, nothing at all. He came away from there, just abandoned completely, and us abandoned too. So I understand what you're saying, but my advice would be: if you're going into these services, take somebody with you. <laughs> Definitely take somebody with you, and <laughs> you know, if necessary, you need to record conversations because. Everything that was said and everything that was done was was twisted and changed. And, and this really, really concerns me. And I know this is happening right across the UK. I don't know what the Royal College of Psychiatrists are doing. I have no idea what they are doing. I, I don't understand what's going on. Was it a government objective to to it's, it's like it's almost like it's a cull. It's almost you, you, have you heard of um, democide? Where a government's policies allows um, less fortunate people maybe to die. <laughs> I I do know, and, and I don't want to just take away from the message we're delivering, but as a very broad stroke from it is. from, it from is a broad. failing mental health till till that, mm. and it's but it stems from somewhere. You know, it comes from somewhere that this very poor standard of service that he got. I mean, very poor, because I work in, you know, and I've said it before, I say a hundred times, I work in maternity service. You don't really have room. You don't have room not to follow the rules. You have to. There's no room to go outside the box. But not even to be in a, you know, a completely a, no boxes at all in Connell's case. None whatsoever. I, I just, I'm just so shocked. Just so shocked at that. And they really didn't take him seriously. Do you know, if they would have been honest as well, but the harm that they have caused us and caused me um, from covering up is, is, is awful and there, there's no need no need just don't do it okay they got it wrong doctor didn't go out that morning to cause Colin any harm I know that okay the one that discharged him without any follow up or you know properly looking at his records and, and understanding what was going on with him didn't go into work that day to cause Colin any harm um, but what they did after they all knew what they were doing they made that choice. That was their decision. They chose to cover up. And I'm sorry, you can't do that. You need to learn your lessons. You know, I would have taken, I would have sat down with them and said, look, you know, you and I would have bawled my eyes out. I know I would have, you know, why, why did you do it? And I would have questioned, it probably made them feel awful. You know, why did you do that? Well, look, I just want to say, you know, 
firstly, we're so sorry about you, mm-hmm. you've suffered the loss of your son. Under all this, under the pain and anger and the, the lies and all the thing of it is, is a mother's lost her son, mm-hmm. their sister's lost a brother, there's a father's lost a son. That, to me, I just want to say from us, we're, we're so sorry for your loss because when when things like this happen and, and, and you go through all this procedure, it'll never take away your memories of, and, and sometimes it's the death we remember, not the life. And, and, and hopefully you get some peace in it and, and you find the answers, the, the, the truth, the peace that you need. We know how things work. It's not always like that. I hope that you find peace. I hope that somewhere in this, that, that you know, how you've been treated post thing, you can have that moment where you sit and smile about that wee boy run up and down the pitch, you know, the funny... The, the you know and and that's for me i always worry that that is the problem in in the, when we lose someone we love so much we we think so much of the death and 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 i hope you get that peace and i hope you get that answer and it just to me there's so many things that there's there's left question marks over but for me and i just want to thank you for coming up and, and sharing that with us thank you thanks for having me it's a long road still to go on thank you very much Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>